All right, everybody, welcome back to another episode of The Mind of George Show. Today, I am excited to have a very special guest. I am stoked. He is my big brother, like the biggest version of Dennis the Menace you can imagine, like 6'5", 200 and something pounds, I can't even imagine. Played for every football team, was a massive lineman. I'm blessed to call him like one of my best friends. He also happens to be like a rhetoric major and a psychology major and one of the smartest humans I know who blows my mind Every time we speak, and he went to some smart, cool schools that are, I don't know, Ivy League and wasted a lot of money that he says helps make him smart and argue with me more. But I learned a lot on today's podcast, but it's fun. It's a blast. John and I talked into a ton of stuff, how hollow arguments that make you lose every single time, the three key factors needed to win any argument, why words are important, but reactions are everything at events, and why you should pay attention to all the little details, how I shifted into alignment with events and changed everything. Are you giving back? Are you playing the game when you're sharing your platform? And when the student is ready, the master appears. And here's my last note for John. I've had the pleasure of spending a lot of time with this man, and I know who his friend circle is, and we all laugh about something because whenever he's around, we're always just listening and taking notes because we learn so much, and this episode is no different. So without further ado, I want to welcome one of my dear friends to the show, the incredible John Wellborn. So let's get into the episode. everybody, welcome back to another episode of The Mind of George Show. And I will say, just to give a little context before I, I bring this guest on, this is probably an episode that I am the most excited, also the most nervous about at the same exact time. So I don't know if I should be in fear for my life or very excited because of the relationship I have with this man who I happen to meet uh, filming a shit show of a television show that became one of my core <laughs> memories because of the fun that we had together. And then I was yeah. like, I know why I didn't have an older brother because I wasn't going to meet my older brother until I was 38 years old. And I'm in the middle of a desert with him eating tacos and flipping motorcycles over while we try to film it out of the back of a van. And so yeah. then I come to find out He's one of the most incredible men ever. And then I just listen. And every time he speaks, I take notes. And I feel like I learn through osmosis, through experience, through being a witness. He is one of the most integrous, grounded, solid, giving, honest fucking men that I have ever met. And his accomplishments have a laundry list that I couldn't even begin to start. So, oh, John, my dear friend, welcome to the show. Oh, dude, thank you so much. That is by far the nicest introduction I've ever received. Uh, George, I hope that at my funeral you can give that eulogy. John, and if you ever need a hype man, bro, I am good with a microphone. <laughs> like, I will. Dude, I, um, I, I was always, I put it like this, I've, uh, I've been a George fan since we went on that motorcycle ride. I, like, we'll set the stage. Uh, Matt Vincent calls and says, hey, I got this deal with Indian Motorcycles. We want to ride from San Francisco to Joshua Tree eight days. Uh, can you do it? And I was like, well, yeah, I can. Uh, what's the deal? He's like, we're going to fly you out. We're going to get on motorcycles and just kick ass. And uh, that's all he told yeah. me. So uh, I show up in San Francisco, which I always think, too, is um, one, there's prerequisites. One, you have to be able to disappear for eight days, which is hard for a lot of people. Yeah. And two, you have to be willing to jump on a motorcycle and ride a thousand plus miles on a bike you don't know. <laughs> Which, uh, you know, I, I started riding when I was, you know, I think I bought my first bike at 18. So I got a ton of miles under my belt. And then also, you know, the flexibility to be able to go do my job anywhere. So uh, we fly to San Francisco, jump on. We go to this hotel. I meet George. Um, I meet, you know, Matt, his girl, and uh, the other people on the adventure. And uh, we take off. And, dude, we're, we're kicking ass through. And uh, it was probably one of the more fun things that I've done in a long time for the mere fact that uh, I wasn't overly stressed. There wasn't really an agenda. I wasn't planning it. I didn't have anything uh, other on my list, on my bucket list, other than just to enjoy the beautiful views and hopefully make some memories and meet some people. Yeah. And I just happened to connect with my brother from another mother, George, just for the mere fact <laughs> that uh, uh, we had a girl that was riding with us and the bikes were pretty heavy. So every time she went to turn, she dumped the bike and then one of us would have to jump off the bike and then get her back into position. And then one time she like went off, off the, the road, road like, and, oh, and crashed the bike, <laughs> laid it out in the ditch. We were like down a hillside and George and I are like, you know, like jumping in there, trying to make sure she's okay. Somehow got this bike to the top and I'm like, dude, we so didn't sign up for this, but like, I'm so glad that it like, it turned into this adventure. 
And, um, and like the food was incredible. And really how I knew George was uh, my soulmate was we sat next to each other at dinner. And I'm, I'm like super, uh, like I go to a restaurant. I don't trust restaurant people having like, I don't know, just maybe bad experiences. Like I don't send food back. I don't ask for anything like off the menu, whatever. George is like, you know, can you bring the maitre d' and, and the, the chef out? I'd like to like mix these three things. Can you slice this and do this? And he's like making all these adjustments. And I'm like looking at this guy and being like, oh my God, like I would never do this. This is amazing. So then George like gets his food and he's like, you know what would make this perfect? He like whispers and like the lady brings him back honey and he starts drizzling honey. And I'm like, you gotta be fucking kidding me with this guy. And then he looks at me and he goes, try it. And I like had it. It was probably like the best thing I had from that moment on. Whatever George ordered, I was like, just give me two. Which I've never done in my life. You ask my wife, she almost fell over and passed out because she knows I'm not like that. I'm like, uh, he's way better at ordering than me. I'll just eat whatever George eats, and I'm good. I know I'm going to have an amazing meal. So it was. Uh, I, I like, um, like you know, the five love languages. You know the. You know what the sixth is? Food. 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 It's it's the sixth love language. When you find somebody that like clicks with you in that, I'm like, we just found our love language, yeah. which is. The fact that like you probably have the most amazing ordering, like it was, it was crazy. I was like, I'll just get whatever he's having. I'm, I'm, I'm like his girl now. He just is going to order for me, and I'm fine with I it. Remember, it was so good, so good. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Those pizza. I was like, oh my god, this is unreal. And then we went to that. Uh, I mean, it's so dorky, but like we went to that that place in Joshua Tree that had that epic steaks oh, yeah. and like those. Like you, you were like, we're going to get the flat iron. I'm like, really, the flat? All right, I guess we're getting the flat irons. And uh, they were, it was insane. It was so but, good. Yeah, we, um, yeah, the uh, the views were amazing, and the dude who was kind of leading the adventure is like a, a interesting cat. There's a lot of like um, what a guy could say, like not a fully developed human in a lot of ways, but uh, a real big foodie. Yep. Yeah, so that that made it pretty neat, and that we got to eat some really amazing restaurants and see some really kick ass views ride some really fun motorcycles and like just coming down, we came out of Bakersfield and we were riding like 120 just open, yep. you know, George, George is like shooting content and video <laughs> of his riding. It's like 120 and George, I like look over and he's like one hand riding with his camera. And I'm like, God damn it. I love this man. He's the best. <laughs> it was, it's true. It literally like I, for like, it reminded me so much of like being at boot camp in the Marine Corps on so many aspects because of that undeveloped human thinking <laughs> He could treat us like we were recruits, but then you and I yeah. being inside of the joke and then understanding how fun it was. <clears throat> but the food. Yeah. And because of that, like, I just didn't care and I just wanted to laugh. And so every moment was just great. And I'm like, well, we're yeah. already in this. And so I got so yeah. fat and ate so much food. <laughs> And then everybody's favorite photo was one of the photos that the undeveloped human got of me looking at you while like holding a sandwich, like I'm in yeah. love. And I have that photo. Uh, I, I, I I have it on my phone yeah. too. Uh, when you like text or call, that photo pops up. It's uh, uh, yeah. We went to this kick-ass sandwich shop, and like I like I know George. I know you're a foodie, and like you know, like the uh, um, the, the paleo stuff you did is incredible. Like I I'm, I'm super basic. Uh, with like, you know, um, like, you know, I've always eaten like the most basic paleo diet and I'm not really, uh, like I like to go to neat places that have like good ambiance and I can try neat things like just like everybody should. But like, we went to these obscure sandwich yeah. shops and it was like, it was, it was really in that, even that angels tacos, those tacos, was amazing. man. I, yeah. Some, some of the best we had, but, uh, it was, it was neat that we got to ride the bikes, but like the food was cool, but like to be a bit in the, um, in the scenery and to be able to experience that. Like I, I, I grew up in California, I lived there for most of my life. Uh, I live in Texas now, but the ability to like experience that, like we did on highway one was truly amazing. And then the, uh, the, the dichotomy of the stress of the dude who was producing it with Matt and his girl, like that whole like <laughs> dynamic was like, I was just so happy to be a passenger and not have it be my gig yes. because as you know, like, like when you put on a gig, like all the pressure yeah. on you and this and this, and I could just see them like seethering and melting. And like, it was just like, Oh, thank God we're just going to be over here having a good time. Just tell me where to be. And, I'm, and yep. we'll just ride. Yep. All know? right. Pick Jen's bike up. You turn. We'll shoot it again. Whatever you say, just tell yeah. us what we have to do to get to the next meal. That's all we want to know. Oh yeah. Yeah, and uh, I mean to go through Monterey. I don't remember if you remember we were coming across in Monterey, and the, the wind, wind was like like 
Yeah, it, it was like a like a hundred mile an hour headwind we were riding into. So the bikes are just getting all pushed over, we're heads down and just charging through it. So there was an interesting, fun element of like uh, like a little bit of danger, but more worried because I knew that the um, some of the people that were riding us weren't necessarily the best riders. Yeah. Whereas you know I've ridden in everywhere and uh, in all climates, and so I'm, I'm not necessarily worried. But then you're riding, and you're like, God, I hope these people don't get picked off. This is going to be a bad deal. So there was an element in that. Yeah, one. I felt like you and I kept going front and back, and we're like, uh-huh. we got them. No, we got them. We got them. Yeah, those mm-hmm. um, man, but those tacos, dude. I. I got to tell you, I have, just so you know, and I haven't disclosed this, I have already flown back once just to have the tacos. <laughs> and I, I yeah. have probably told, and just because this undeveloped human will hate this so much, let me just tell everybody about this taco place, okay? Now, I haven't, I yeah. haven't exposed this on the podcast yet, but I've mentioned it four times without telling you, but I'm going to break the news right now because everybody deserves to know. So on yeah. Instagram, it's called Angels Tijuana Tacos. On Instagram, yep. Angels Tijuana Tacos. Now, they're all over SoCal from like LA down to San Diego, but they move spots like every day. Yep. And these people set up a full production factory from basically the chickens are probably behind Lowe's, but they basically mm-hmm. have the raw meat to marinate, slice, cook, roast, hand grind the matzah, make the tortillas from scratch, cook them, assemble the tacos, all will you walk down the sidewalk. And these are the best tacos yep. of your life. And and it, they do pop ups. It's insane. Basically, you get on Instagram, and they're like, "Hey, we're going to be here for one day," and then you show up in this full production, and the food's incredible. And they do pop ups all over LA. No, uh, I was back in LA, and we uh, um, I queued in, and we've been I, like, I took my kids, I took my wife, like we've taken everybody. Uh, and the the best part about it was the dude who we were with like wouldn't tell us no. the name, and he was all like weirdly. Um, and don't take this word the wrong way because I, I like use it in very sparingly, but super cunty yep. is the only word I can kind of like describe about him and was just like weird about it. And they was like, I was like, what's the name of this place? I can't tell you. And then when we got there, I was like, you know, I had to like talk to the people and get their card. And they were like, put the word out. And this guy's like, don't put the word out. I'm yeah. Like, oh, God, this is like this weird millennial hipster. You know, I have to like stand in the, like an alley and crawl through a back door to go to some speakeasy bullshit. Yeah. Yeah. It reminded me, I described him as Cruella DeVille energy. That's how I described it. <laughs> and so I was like, he was just missing his Dalmatians, but everything else fit. Like I was like, this is, this is completely perfect. And so, yeah. So, but, but did go down as like a core memory. And now I have an incredible friend out of it. So I couldn't be happier. So um, I, I actually think that's perfect. Cause we, we, we talked about how you grew up in California and then now are in mm-hmm. Austin, right? So uh, kind of early on in the career, you obviously went into the NFL, but can you kind of tell everybody your background and how you went from NFL to rhetoric, to degrees, to CrossFit seminars, to now podcast, you know, entrepreneur extraordinaire? Yeah. Um, wow. Uh, sorry. It's a little, I'll give you the elevator pitch, but I uh, grew up in Southern California, the youngest of three boys. Uh, played a ton of sports, got into martial arts pretty early and boxing. My brothers both played college football, so I decided to go play football because obviously that's what cool kids do. <laughs> um, I, uh, I really just wanted to lift weights. Uh, I was like, wanted to be big and strong like my brothers, so lifting weights was important. Uh, I was very fortunate to like have a you know, world-class power lifter lived in my neighborhood. Mm-hmm. We trained in his garage. Um, I grew bigger and stronger and got a ton of scholarship offers, um, you know, something like uh, way too many. <laughs> and, uh, you know, decided where to go to school. And um, I took trips to uh, SC, UCLA, Colorado, Nebraska, and Cal Berkeley. Mm-hmm. And, uh, you know, all those schools were great. Nebraska would have been a national champion, um, all great schools. But I had this like weird suspicion that, uh, you know, I'm going to use Cal, I'm going to use this football deal to be able to go to college and be, basically get a degree. And my dad made a great point to me. He said, you know, at the end of the day, regardless of what happens with football, what degree do you want to hang on your wall? Mm. And uh, I decided to go to Berkeley um, just because, you know, the valedictorian in my high school didn't get into Berkeley. And, uh, you know, there are a lot of smart people have gone there. Uh, So um, and also the trip that I take when you're in high school, you get to go take recruiting trips. Mm. And uh, my dad was uh, um, a trial attorney for over 50 years. He since passed away. But uh, my dad was super smart. Like graduated high school at 16, graduated college at 19, graduated uh, law school at like 21, and then was a practicing attorney till Jesus. probably two weeks, two months before he passed away at 80 years old. Wow. 
and uh, like on the floor, trial attorney, gnarly murder one stuff. That's what he did. And uh, I always wanted to be an attorney. My middle brother is an attorney. My older brother went to law school, but he does commercial insurance. And uh, so it's kind of been our family business. And so um, I told him, hey, I'd love to go uh, talk to somebody at the law school. So I got a chance to go sit with this old man, uh, 82 years old, guy named Adrian Cragen, and he was since passed away many years ago. And I asked him, like, you know, if I want to be successful and I want to be an attorney and I want to go learn, what do I need to do? And he made a statement that day that even at 17 or 18 years old at the, um, at the time, I've taken with me everywhere, which is if you don't learn to read and write to the best of your ability, you'll never learn to think. Mm. And he's like, learn to read and write to the best of your ability. And then you become a thinker. He said, the problem with the world is that people start thinking before they learn to read and write. And he goes, if you don't read and write to the best of your ability, you'll never learn to think. So many recommended. He said, you know, here at Berkeley, we have a undergraduate degree in rhetoric. And of course, like everybody else, I said, like, what do you mean rhetoric? He's like, it's an English philosophy degree with an argumented approach. And you'll learn all the classics. You'll learn all of the, the greatest thinkers. And you'll have to write in such a way that uh, is very advantageous to go to law school. And then he leans over to me and kind of gives me a wink and said, and by the way, there's a scholarship called the Adrian Cragen Scholarship that I endowed for a four-year Berkeley Letterman to go to Bolt Hall. And I have a little bit of poll on who I can get in here. So I said, okay, um, you know, uh, Bolt Hall is, since, uh, is the school of Berkeley Law, is, is the Berkeley Law uh, School. They've since changed their name because they found that like um, the Bolt guy was named after said something racist in like the 40s. So they had to, of course, rip it down. So it's just Berkeley <laughs> Law now. But uh, uh, I decided at that moment, um, one, I was going to be a rhetoric major. Two, I needed to learn to read and write to the best of my ability, but my goal was to go to law school there. And so I graduated in four years with a degree in, in uh, rhetoric and then my master's in my fifth year because I was a uh, redshirt in my first year. So I got a master's in education and then took my LSATs and was applying to go to law school and then got drafted to go play for the Philadelphia Eagles. So I was the second pick in the fourth round, showed up there and I thought to myself, like, how long do people play in the NFL? What's the average? A couple years. Um, I, I didn't know anybody that played in the NFL. I surely didn't really know what, what like the future had in store for me. And I came out, uh, went to mini camp and then went to what's called OTAs, organized team activities, and ended up being the starter coming out and going into training camp that year. And then came in and started as a rookie and started the rest of my NFL career. Um, started for, you know, five years for the Philadelphia Eagles at, at right tackle and then at left guard and then went and played uh, right tackle and right guard for the Kansas City Chiefs for four years. Uh, blocked for like Priest Holmes and, um, you know, uh, Larry Johnson and, you know, uh, played with Tony Gonzalez and those guys. Um, played on, you know, two of the best lines of football. And then my eighth year, or sorry, my 10th year in 2008, went to go play with the New England Patriots. Uh, my season got ended a little early with a knee injury, which was okay because Tom Brady tore his ACL that year. So they didn't get a chance to go to Super Bowl. So I don't feel that bad about it. And then, uh, uh, and then I came home, had knee surgery, and teams were calling me, seeing if I would come back and play for that year. And one of the phone calls that I got that day, um, as I was rehabbing on the couch, literally I was sitting there and my knee was like in a CPM machine, okay. um, was, was from, uh, the CEO, the creator of CrossFit, Greg, and Greg Glassman. Yeah. He called me on the phone and, uh, I'll never forget it said, um, you know, would you come and help us develop our technology on how to train athletes? Mm. And I had never thought about training or more importantly, something like CrossFit or fitness or really anything in terms of technology. So, uh, I drove out to Arizona, uh, met with he and his wife kind of presented what I knew about, you know, performance training and all the stuff I had done. And they said, great, um, go do it and call us when you're ready to go. So 30 days later, I realized that uh, as I was driving home, I realized that I had a very small window of good faith and that the longer I pushed it out, the that good faith would diminish. So I struck with Aaron's hot, came back, called the guy, designed a website, came up with a logo, came up with a name, designed a program and launched almost 30 days later wow. to 17,000 hits. They, they put it on, on CrossFit.com on uh, March 31st, 2009. We got 17,000 hits. I got hundreds of emails. Then they called me and said, hey, you're going to have to teach a seminar. So 30 <laughs> days later, I launched a traveling seminar and proceeded for the next nine years to go teach hundreds of seminars all over the globe from the Arctic Circle all the way down to New Zealand and give away free programming. And the cool part is, is I gave away free performance stuff and then got a chance to travel the world and meet the people that were doing the program and put them through a two-day diagnostic, which allowed me to really just understand my technology and what I was doing in real time. Mm. And then we started getting into a bunch of military contracting. We did a bunch of stuff with Naval Special Warfare and the SEALs. 
Um, and then we did, uh, we were in contracting to bring power athlete systems to the 18th Airborne Corps. And uh, that was like 90,000 troops. And we were in contracting for that, which necessitated a move out of California just because, you know, Fort Bragg, Fort mm -hmm. Hood, um, you know, Fort Drum, Fort Campbell, all the places for the 18th Airborne Corps were kind of on our list. So we got out of uh, uh, California in 2016, obviously pre Joe Rogan. And my <laughs> goal was to come to Texas. Well, that's how I break Austin. Yeah, like, yeah. are you pre, pre, or pre or post, post Joe? Joe. Yeah, totally. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, we came out here, bought a bunch of land. I was able to build uh, a gym and a shop and like obviously a, a, an office and you know podcast studio and pretty much went from like leasing a ton of commercial real estate in Orange County to pretty much just having everything encased on our property. Mm -hmm. And uh, my company, Power Athlete, we do like large group performance training, help people develop fitness technologies, which uh, has ended up kind of leveraging into, you know, programming and daily workouts. Um, and then obviously coaching. Uh, we do a ton of stuff in certifying coaching on how to train athletes in this Power Athlete method. And uh, just really just information resources. And what's nice is all the stuff that I learned in college and obviously through my 10 years in the NFL has been able to pour it over very nicely into the market in which I use it. Yeah, man. I, I, I love it. It's, um, it's like so inspiring to hear. I have so many questions and then, but here, let me, let me start here. Cause I think this might frame kind of where this is going to go. So you gave me some incredible feedback after the event, but you use three terms that I hear you use all the time. And you, you told me about these terms on the motorcycle show and then I went to read about them and I'm like reading about them. I'm like, I need John to explain these to me again, but I, I'm kind yeah. I'm kind of getting them, but I feel like it kind of will set the tone for any question that will come. So can you explain pathos, logos yeah. and egos and, and that whole, your philosophy and everything? Yeah, no, it was, uh, um, it really stems back to the Greeks. Uh, and George, um, for somebody that doesn't know, uh, like the classical kind of teaching of this stuff, um, you instinctively have done these things and did them. And really, it, it's like the mastery of this thing. It's kind of like athleticism, right? So um, I became, all right, well, let me get into this and I'll yeah. come back to this. So uh, like your ability to like move between these, these three things was as good as I've ever seen to the point where uh, like I've, I've spoken a lot. I've met a lot of really intelligent people. But I don't think I've seen somebody do it as well as you've done it in a long, long time to the point where I was like, wow, uh, I am and I, I, like I'll tell you, I was in awe of it. I, I was like beaming. I was like, dude, this is so it's so amazing to uh, and I, I, I don't use this lightly like that. I have friends that are dragon slayers that can get up and do this stuff and that are so fucking good. And uh, I'm such a fan of like uh, of, of my friends and human, like not necessarily of humanity, but like of the people in my circle, I want to see you stand on the biggest stage and do your best and absolutely slay it. And I want to be in the audience, like cheering you on. I got to see it and I was, uh, I was, uh, yeah, I was humbled. Uh, but, to, to talk to you guys a little bit about it, uh, ethos, pathos and logos come from the Greeks and Aristotle, Plato, um, they looked and what they did is they formulated arguments into three parts. And your ability to kind of seamlessly tie these together in an argument is really how you convince people of something or more importantly, make a, a, a really good point. And if you miss one or you don't do it, it makes your arguments hollow. And that's why when you hear people argue or people make kind of these you know, different claims, you're like, God, this just doesn't it doesn't resonate with me. I don't know why I don't trust them. And it's because they've broken these rules or they don't adhere to them. The first one is ethos which comes down to like who you are, like what is your ethos? What have you established? What have you done? And George does an incredible job of continuing to build his ethos by reaching back into the bag and you know, this is who I am. This is where I've come from. These are the companies I've worked with and you slip it in and you do an excellent job because it's not done disingenuous. Like when people do this and it feels like where they like name drop to the point where you're like, oops, you dropped that name. Let me give it back to you. <laughs> And, and, and like, I'm sure you do that, George, like, like you run into people and they want to impress you. So they just start name dropping and you're like, yeah, you're just throwing names out. Now, if you were to tell me a story about you and that person where it's like, Hey, George, and I got to ride motorcycles and it was amazing. It's not like, Oh, I know George. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. 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 Or like, I know. Yeah. So, so it's done in a disingenuous way, but you also have to have the chops and the ethos. You're like, you know, uh, I started this paleo blog. Um, I was a Marine. This is who I am. And this, and like, all of these things go to create who you are as an ethos. And it's not done disingenuous. This is legitimate stuff you've done. Mm -hmm. It's like me talking about football or training. 
And they go, well, you know, who are you to talk on this stuff? I played 10 years in the NFL. I use this stuff to be able to beat up the toughest dudes in the world and be a starter for over a decade in the NFL. I played with this guy and this guy, you know, like, you know, you can, uh, you know, and I can give you everything. You can reach out to anybody, you know, that played against me. They're going to tell you the same thing. Yep. Right. So uh, that ethos comes, you know, and then, um, uh, you know, so like this piece of establishing who you are is so important and people forget this all too often. And then what they do at the beginning of a talk, they talk to you like they'll give you their history, they build their ethos, and then they go into stuff and they forget to revisit it. Because what you have to constantly do is if you go too much here, it's like a, like an EQ. You got to continue to tune it. And that's what you did so well. You built your ethos, you got into all this other stuff, and then you came back to it. Um, the next one is Logos, which is the logical, right? So, hey, these are the companies I've worked on. These are the numbers. We took them from 8 million to 140 million. These are the amount of people I work with. I work with 10,000 and I you know, grew that to this and this. And here's a company I built. And so like, these are all the numbers. So all of a sudden people hear the logical appeal. Like this guy knows what he's doing because he's done it before. And here's the numbers I have to support it. The next one is the pathos, the emotional. Now, all of a sudden you're like, you know, engaging with people and being like, I believe in you, you can do this. Why? Because I didn't believe in who I am. Mm -hmm. But you know what, I was able to, to, to hone myself into the person I am. And your ability to like have all of these people in the room, and then all, like trail in on one person and have a moment with them that includes the group was as good as I've ever seen. Um, you know, I was there, um, the information I was interested in, because I find the marketing stuff really fascinating, because it's outside the realm of what I do. Mm -hmm. Uh, but I am, uh, forever like not judging, but I'm interested in like the production. I want to know how you set up the room, why you did this, how the whole thing fits the colors, uh, like the music, like I, like I'm fascinated by the nuts and the bolts and how you present like the flow at which you did it. And, uh, that's what I'm impressed by because it shows, uh, it shows attention to detail. It shows intelligence. It shows uh, like a just a, an extremely intelligent knack for understanding how to connect to people and that you have an, an attention to detail that for people like me, mm -hmm. like instantly converts me. Like it'd be like, um, you know, and, and there's there's things and I'm sure you've heard people yeah. and you're like, God, I just don't know why this doesn't work. And it's because, you know, either the ethos is disingenuous, yeah. the logos doesn't make sense. Or they, or they don't constantly go back and kind of revisit their ethos. Uh, and you do that through stories. You do it by slipping little pieces in. And so these three, ethos, pathos, and logos, work in such a way uh, so that when you're engaging somebody, whether it be in an argument or like an event like this, instant buy-in. And your ability to seamlessly move between those three mm -hmm. is as good as I've seen. And I was, uh, I, I, like, I don't know if you saw, but I was like almost laughing to myself a little bit <laughs> because it was so good. And I was so fucking proud. I, like, I, and, and I know that sounds really dorky, no, but doesn't. I was so I proud I of you. It. And I, I dude, I, I was, I was like so proud of you. And I was like, fuck it. I was looking around at these people. I'm like, do you guys see like <laughs> what this motherfucker is doing? And like, no. And, and you know what? They didn't. No. And that's the fucking beauty of it. They just knew that they were being influenced and led on a journey yeah. and they were willing to follow anything you said but they didn't understand the genius and the mechanics and all that whereas that's like what i look at and uh, because here's the deal I, like i said i mean dude i taught 300 plus seminars for crossfit football i've taught hundreds for power athlete i mean keynote speaking i've taught all this military stuff i mean travel the world and so it's nice to see when somebody does it and um uh and does it that well and more importantly i mean obviously the words are important but the reaction of the audience where like their hair was on fire, they were in emotions, one lady's crying, one guy's over there laughing. And I'm like, wow, like this was, I, I, I came back and I told, uh, you know, the guy, the, the people I work for, uh, or not, I mean the, not the people like my employees yeah. and the people I work with, I was like, man, I'm so sad that you guys weren't there to see this. Um, and you know, they think I'm a huge dork in this way. But uh, I really love to see the way people present and how they do it. And like um, and I when I see my friends do it and they don't do it well, I always want to like give them some notes or I want to help them along. Like I've seen a bunch of people get up and present and I'm like, man, if you could just lean more on your ethos or if you could work the crowd better, look at that one person and make one person have a moment. Like all, all these other things are just little tricks, but uh, or not not tricks, but they're just techniques to use. And um, it was neat that you're like. Uh, not to say that you're not classically trained because you are, but like not in the same way I am, like as a rhetoric major where I, I like looked and like studied this stuff and to see you do it so masterfully was um, 
was uh, almost a savant. So uh, it, it's it, it was really really beautiful to see. Yeah, I um, your reflections were, were huge. Like, yeah, you you had it through school. I had the uh, goodwill hunting approach, um, and so I a pretty pretty effective on like how you like them apples. And so it helps when you heal the wounds. Because um, here here's what's funny. Like, I love these. Con- like, I'm over here like gloating on cloud nine, but like from my heart because it's so funny when I think about my events. Right, like. When I started doing public events with my mastermind, I did one event that was all content, right? I did one and I finished the event and everyone was like, this was great. And I was like, this was the worst fucking event I've ever been to. And I put it on like I hated it. I was like, there was so much missing. I was like, we didn't have any heightened emotions. Like nobody laughed, Mm -hmm. right? Like I don't even care if we cried. Like nobody laughed. Like there wasn't cheering. Like there was no releasing. There was, it was just like bland as shit. And I was like, this just feels dumb. And I was in that bucket at the time where I just finished being a personal development coach for the last three years. And I was so averse to personal development. And I was like, I am not fucking doing personal development. I'm not bringing it into my business. I'm not a personal development coach. I'm not whatever. But I was so averse to the next event. I just said, fuck it. I'm like, I'm not telling anybody. And I'm just starting with breath work. Like, I'm just going to be like, grab a pillow. I'm going to teach you how to breathe. And then like everybody started crying and screaming. I'm like, oh my God, I just ended my career. Like I'm fucked. Like my whole career is over. I have two and a half days left for these people and I have no idea what I'm about to do. But then the magic happened because the first part of the event was just like raw and open. And then I was like, oh my God. But like when you reflect to me, I try to talk to people about this and I feel so crazy because I'll be like in the room or like thinking about the event when I'm reflecting. I'm like, okay, but if I did this, if I said this, they'd feel this. I'm like, I know this is silly, but if I use this smell. What you did, what you did, which was incredible on day one, you spent the entire first day giving people permission to be successful. You were like, showing them and like, and, and it's, it's so weird for me. Like I never waited around for anybody to tell me to be successful. Yeah. I never asked any, anybody's permission to do anything. Um, so it, it, it's like a, 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 like interesting for me to like sit on the outside. Cause I've never, I've never waited around for anybody's permission. I always figure it's better to ask for forgiveness and permission, but people aren't like that. And you spent almost six, eight hours empowering these people to be successful, to throw off their chains. Here's the limitations that you are having and you are the limitation and you're going to flush those. You don't need those anymore because I have basically given you permission to be successful, Mm -hmm. which uh, is incredible. And I don't know, like the information for me would have been the same either way. I don't need permission, but the people that they, that were there needed that validation from you. Mm -hmm as the uh, you know the person up there and then you know like the uh the pink is so smart it's so smart like it's such an interesting <laughs> color the boots like the way you do it i see pink now and instantly i think of george it's so fucking smart and i know what you're doing and it still works <laughs> and uh and, and then you you did something instinctively that um i'll let you behind the curtain on this one a little bit yeah. Uh, I went to dinner and here's a story you'll never hear anywhere else. I, uh, I went to dinner years ago, um, with, uh, a bunch of NFL players. Uh, we, we, we had a big table, uh, you know, private room at the steakhouse. Uh, a few of those guys were in the hall of fame, multiple hall pros, some of the best players that you'll ever, that you would ever know. I'm not going to tell you their names. Uh, but we were sitting around ordering steaks and the conversation turned into, if you're going to, uh, you know, meet a girl, like how fast do you think you could close her from like, hello to like, let's go home and, you know, obviously have sex. And we just kind of sat around and we realized very quickly that there was something that we called the three prong attack that you have to open, you have to say hello, you have to engage in some way. It usually helps if it's somewhat abrasive in a way. Like, oh, your hair looks like shit. Or like, why would you wear the shoes with that? Or is that your boyfriend? I mean, something a little combative that is going to be different, that's going to spark her emotion because the the difference between love and hate is very close. Mm-hmm. But you have to do something more so than like, oh, you look beautiful. She's going to be like, oh, I hear that a hundred times and be like, your hair looks like shit. You should really motion, uh, you know, get some conditioner. And like, oh, or your, who did your makeup? Or like, I mean, those are funny things, but being like, uh, you know, my classic, what if I saw a girl playing with her hair? I'd be like, you know, you know, twist. Twirling the hair like that is a sign of sexual frustration. You must have a terrible relationship you're going home to. 
you know, things <laughs> like that. So, so it would be the first one would be uh, engaging usually in some way, um, you know, predominantly something that's a little abrasive, but not too abrasive that you get a drink thrown in your face. And then the next one was uh, sharing something. So then you have to share something very quick, like, don't worry, I had terrible hair too once. Right. So then now you've created a common bridge. And then the third part is teaching them something. So now all of a sudden you've gone from like creating some form of emotion. Now you've gone to sharing something. Now we're on a week. Well, now I'm going to put myself in a teacher's position. I'm going to show you how to make your hair better so that you never have to ever hear comments like this again. And the ability to work those three, which we call that three pronged attack, uh, really became a 100% like, I mean, that was like, as we sat around with these guys, we kind of basically like whiteboarded this whole thing. And then we went out and everybody used their three prong attack and it worked with 100% success. Now, when you work when you have a bunch of NFL players and like, you know, I mean, obviously the stakes are a little bit higher there or the, yeah, the, the, odds. Uh, the odds are stacked a little high, but it, um, it became a really interesting conversation. And then when I started going out and teaching seminars, uh, I basically taught my coaches and the people about the three prong attack. So we literally put things in early in the seminar to break them the fuck down. And then we were like, you know what? Everybody gets broken down and we shared. And then we taught them how to overcome this. And it became like, okay, you know what? Like, like in the seminars, we're going, this is where we start. This is where the three prong attack. This is the way to the point where like, we got to find a couple people to fucking get into. Hopefully we can get a little combative and then we can do this. And it worked like night and day into converting people. So uh, you did it like that. And it was so smooth. And as you were, as you, I was like, oh my God, he's using the three prong attack. He knows ethos, pathos and logos and three prong. He's basically stolen all my mojo. <laughs> And uh, you, you did it. And, and the place you did it so well was when you brought everybody out. We had to do the silent, the, uh, the counting yep. with the eyes closed. Yep. You, dude, it was seamless. And to the point where you found people that were honest about lying. And then you motherfucked the group because they weren't the best because other people did what they and you held them to a higher standard. Mm -hmm. And you fucking ripped that rug out from under them, which I was like, yes. You fucking did it. And they all fucking walked back with their tails between their legs. And then, you know, what you did, you built them up. Yep. It was, uh, it was so well done that I, the notes that I was taking weren't necessarily on the course. They were on how you were doing these different techniques and these different, like just arranging this thing. It was so well done that I left there practically like I was floating on cloud nine. I was like, God damn it. Um, it was really nice to see. Like, I mean, just it was beyond nice. Like when I say nice, I, I don't like it's uh, uh, I was like, fuck, dude, I got to see a master work. And like it was like seeing a, uh, a you know, a world class magician and knowing how he's doing the tricks and being like, he's really good at it. I need to up my game. And here's here's how I do it. And then the other thing that you do really well, um, and I know I'm going to continue to H.J. George all day, but uh, you move between masculine and feminine energy better than anybody I've ever seen. Mm -hmm. Like you're the mother and the father, uh, like unbelievable. And it's ability to switch back and forth between this. I, um, I play the father role, uh, to, you know, I don't have a ton of female energy in that way. Um, you know, Tony Robbins doesn't do that female energy very well. Other people are men that do it. You do this mother and father and move between, you know, the felt, I, I, I call it the velvet hammer. Mm. I mean, that's like the, the idea of like, you know, I can hammer and I can hold and this and your ability to like move through it is as good as I've seen. And I was like, I, so I said to somebody, I think it was Alex. I was like, you know, George's ability to use both female and male energy. So I sat next to this, um, one of George's guys, uh, um, Alex McMahon. McMahon. Yeah. yeah. Uh, really great dude. Uh, he's been to a ton of George's stuff. And I think like, I kept like talking to him to the point where George actually got mad at the group for talking. It was totally me. And he looked right at me and I'm like, guilty. I fucking am talking, but I was trying to explain to Alex what you were doing because I could, he's like, what are you fucking writing? And I'm like, dude, this is, so I started trying to explain it to him and he's like, looks at me like I'm a fucking weirdo. And I'm like, Oh God, you know, and, um, it was, uh, it, it was really well done, man. I was, uh, I was really, really impressed. And I was, um, I was forever grateful that, uh, I, I got a chance to see it. Brother, it's, um, it's a, it's a gift for me. I, um, you know, most of the time, like I invite my friends or they say they're coming. Right. And then I feel like a 13 year old little boy, just excited. My friends are going to be there. And then I'm like, I don't know if they're about to witness 
the most epic head-on train collision they've ever seen, some unicorn ride across a rainbow, or me just completely emotionally dump my stuff everywhere and not be able to get it in. But but uh, uh, I don't like even if you like even if you were to like um, I mean so um, you shared a ton of personal stuff which uh, I, I commend you for I I don't uh, I I like really struggle um, you know like with per like like sharing personal stuff just because I grew up kind of like um, as an NFL player yeah. uh, uh, like we were always reminded to be very, very private. Like, uh, you know, there's stalkers and there's weirdos. And now it's weird. It's like with social media, it's like, uh, like, like almost like legal stalking. Yeah. And so, uh, like, you know, we had just a lot of weird stuff. So like, I've always just been very guarded with myself and like not sharing a lot. And, uh, and maybe cause my dad was a criminal defense attorney and my brother does that. And there's a lot of like, I don't know, issues around that. Yeah. So, uh, your ability to like share very personal things, and do it in such a way that like people not only like understand, but become your champions was really well done. Um, like it's uh, sometimes when you hear people share stuff and I, I actually got this, this line from a friend of mine where like sometimes people that are successful share stuff. It's like those guys that are like, let me tell you how hard it was to make my second billion dollars. <laughs> yes. I know exactly and you're what you're talking like, about. Yes. You're kind of like, Fuck you. Yeah. Like, yeah. I don't want to know, like, like, oh, poor you. Like, uh, everybody in your family needed a private jet. So here's how I made it. I, had to, I really had to grind and make my second <laughs> yeah. billion. Right. You're kind of like, okay. Like, uh, like, so, so there's a, you know, when you're successful, there's this like very real trap that you can get into where you sound like the dude who's making their second, oh, poor you, you and your second billion. I'm sure it was so hard. And then all of a sudden, the crowd all of a sudden becomes against you mm-hmm. and the tide turns. And, uh, you, when you shared and like the things that you were sharing were, um, uh, like these people became your champions, which was really real well done. And the harder part was none of it was done nefariously Mm -hmm. and none of it was done with some like, like a nefarious plot where I'm going to do this and this and this. Mm -hmm. It was just you sharing and taking people on a journey Mm -hmm. And almost just putting this like experience together that as I sat back, I saw the pieces, but I knew that the pieces weren't necessarily intentional. Not like, okay, at two 30, I got to give a, a, like a personal, no. you know, thing in my, no, it's, it's just you being you. And, um, that's what was so nice because it didn't feel forced. It just flowed and it was done so well that I was like this motherfucker. Yeah. So, yeah. And, and for me, man, it's one of the greatest gifts to have you in the room because like, the only reason I feel crazy is like, I, you know how much time I spend reflecting, right? Like I sit alone and I just think about people and how they feel and what changes how they feel and what made me feel. And then I'm like, I have an idea. Let's get 80 entrepreneurs to sit in a chair across from each other, play music really loud and then yell in each other's faces for 10 seconds at a time. And then have the fucking guts to throw it in the middle of an event that people are paying money for that I've never done, hoping that it leads to some experience that I'm just going to listen to feedback so I know how to describe it and hope that there was like a win in it. And like to have it reflected though, it's so nice to have somebody to talk to about this though, like that does seminars and does it because I like love this stuff. Like I love it more than anything. I don't give a fuck about content. Content for me. No, it's, it, it's, yeah, no, it, it's incredible. The, uh, the only thing that, so, um, when I used to go teach, uh, our seminars, uh, they were very personal to me because I would use a lot of my antidotes and it was very personal. And, uh, all of a sudden my wife got, uh, we had twins and I couldn't go teach the seminars. And I had, I, I knew that this date was coming obviously because my wife was pregnant for nine months and we knew we were having twins. So I started working with my coaches to like make them into flow masters and kind of like preparing them for the day that I wasn't there. And I just watched them bomb time after time to the point where we would leave. And like, I would like sit at dinner and I would talk to them and I would give them books to read and quotes. And I would try to like lead them. And I was like, dude, you can't use my antidotes. They're my antidotes. If you give my stories or you try to pretend to be me or you use the same terms I do, it'll feel disingenuous and that that'll destroy your ethos. So you guys have to craft your own origin stories and then you have to let like, and I worked for nine months and finally, like right before my wife got, uh, gave birth, I was sitting in the back. Um, and one of the guys got up to, to just, you know, give their intro and like, he, he, he had like gone back and written his own deal and this and this, and it was like, oh, thank God. 
and the hardest thing that I had was that the energy and the expertise that I brought to the seminar, I just wasn't able to do it with twins. Um, so I like couldn't travel as much and just kind of like did this. And I, I, I put other people on the road and they got a lot of opportunities, but at the end of the day, um, they didn't like strike the magic the way that I needed to, not to say they weren't good, but it was like, it was so personal to me yeah. that, uh, um, over time I just saw it kind of dwindle as I, I just couldn't do it because, you know, I mean, family and this, and there were just other reasons. So, I mean, we were also doing like 36 seminars a year. Yeah. Which, which if it was just like per quarter, it would have been fine. But like, it was like, you know, 20 to 25, 36, I'm still teaching 11 to 12 of these. And, um, it just, uh, it kind of dwindled a little bit just because of that. And like, as I was sitting there listening to you, I realized I was like, man, he could probably have the energy to do maybe these four a year. That's it. You couldn't do no, one. I only do, I weekend. only do four a year. Yeah. That's it. Yeah. Like, like one, like one a quarter yeah. is probably max. And uh, the danger of it, and obviously this isn't your revenue stream. This is something you do. And like, it kind of is, uh, like, this is your outlet. Like, I'm sure, yeah. you know, there it's, it's, it's within the stream. It's not like what you do. This is kind of like your ability. And I'm not like, I hate the term giving back. Like it's so fucking overdone when people are like, Oh, I'm giving back. Like, what the fuck does that mean? Right? Like, no, no, this is, um, where I get a chance to stand on stage and literally like own my shit, present it, see if it works, push it back out, see who it is, yep. find other people that are kindred spirits, yep. push those people. You know, it's, it's, um, it's like the, uh, it's your opportunity to be the straw that stirs the drink. That's it. And I like, like you have this big drink and I need to do these periodically just to stir these motherfuckers up in my own head and see it. And, and it's, it's probably, so I realized the significance of why you were doing this, which made it even better for that, that like, you're like, you know what? Um, and you said it great. If you're not, if, if you don't like what you're seeing and you're unhappy, I'll return your fucking money. Cause I don't need yeah. it. Like I, you're paying for the, like to see the show and plug the fuck in, because if you don't have the wherewithal to understand what's happening here, you're not the right person to absorb yep. it. And like, you know, they like, like one of my favorite, um, uh, like, like th this is so interesting in that, like there was a, uh, uh, like through my rhetoric major in college, we had to read between 20 and 30 books a semester. Oh, wow. And so I'll, I'll, all I did was read. Yeah. And it was like, you know, everything from like the cynics to the stoics to Marcus Aurelius to Cicero to, you know, going forward all the way to existentialism with like Dovsieski. I mean, it was like I read everything wow. and I took classes. And so I have this like classical reading knowledge that just stems from like the original thinkers all the way out to like, you know, uh, where I kind of, you know, I mean, the beatniks, right? I was a Jack Kerouac fan. So, um, <clears throat> like, the uh, ability to, like, and I'd say, like, too much, but, um, like, that classical uh, information and, like, you know, like, like the teaching and the ability to, like, uh, you know, read a book and then stand up in a group mm -hmm. and Socratic method and break it into a million people, pieces and argue in this is really... Uh, the catalyst that I needed not only to like sharpen my blade to read the information, but understand it. I just wasn't reading the books just to read them. I was trying to soak in the information so that I could effectively put arrows in my quiver to go to class and fucking knock people down. Yep. Um, you know, there would be obscure parts that I would just obsess on like, Shh, this is going to be my argument. This is what I'm going to fucking put somebody on their back with. And so uh, there's a, just an interesting quote in that, um, you know, uh, when the, students ready the master appears it's, it's kind of the gist of it but like not everything is impactful to everybody at the same time mm -hmm. um like you know you could talk like you can read a quote um you know that some great thinker thought you know eh, 20 years later you read the same quote and you have enough life experience or enough understanding where it like punctures your soul and you think god damn that dude wrote that three thousand years ago how is it still impactful today or when i read it 20 years ago yeah. it wasn't so there were things that I read when I was younger that I was obsessed with this idea. Here's something obscure in this. And then all of a sudden now as an adult with a father and kids and doing all these other things, I, I reach back and I pull back to those memories. And I think like, man, I didn't have the experience, the life experience to like understand what I was reading and more importantly, what I was doing. But I'm so glad I did because unless I had been in that situation, I would have never read any of the shit. Yeah. 
And so it's been it's been really impactful for me in that way. But it's it, it, it's obviously helped me learn to think. Yeah, and I was going to ask you about learning to think, right? Because you know what I love is like, and I resonate so much when you speak because I think like you, right? Like when I am set with a challenge or a problem. And then I go to look for the answer. When I find the answer, I'm not looking for the answer. I look how the answer was like achieved. Because if I literally just get the answer, I'm going to have the same problem again in like a week. And I was like, no, no, no. Mm. How did they get to this answer? Because I want to be able to recreate it because that's how I put quivers in my my arrows, right? And so for you, when you talk about like looking at me running the event... I think like that everywhere I go, every restaurant I go into, every coffee shop. I mean, I am like, oh my gosh, you could have closed that thing. You could have said this. They would have felt this like everywhere. Mm -hmm. I was never like that as a kid. I don't think I was just trying to survive. Like, is that a muscle that you've always had or did it like increase when you were going through rhetoric? Is it something that you were like, I want to think like this or have you always had like an engineering typey brain? Um, so I remember, um, one thing that was upsetting to me, uh, in the NFL was, um, we were just like cast aside as morons. Mm -hmm. So, you know, whether it be the media, the coaches, like, uh, you know, sitting like as a fairly intelligent person sitting through a meeting where the coach repeats the same thing over and over again is like almost like my kryptonite. Um, but like, it was to the point of like, the coach would come in and give the exact same talk. And you'd be like, didn't he say this two days ago verbatim? And like the people would look and I'd be like, didn't he just say, they'd be like, what are you talking about? I'd be like, Oh my God, I feel like I'm taking crazy pills. So a lot of times it was, and it's why in the off season, I I didn't train with the teams. I went home. uh, I literally had to get away from it just because it was so, um, such a mundane, like edge, like it, it was not a mentally or emotionally stimulating. It was physically stimulating, and that I got to play and do the game. I like the preparation. I like the training. I like the battle and the conflict. Uh, I did not enjoy the lack of mental acuity or uh, like nothing was filling my bucket. Mm. So um, the only way I knew, and I know this is going to sound so dorky, but um, uh, and this is pre podcast, which I wonder now, like if if I had had the podcasting space, if I could have like scratched this itch, but I've always used, uh, I've always viewed um, reading the classics as not just reading the classics of having a conversation with the smartest people ever walked the earth. Mm. So I, I get a chance to read something, uh, you know, I mean, there, I don't know, a million different things. And as I pull that book out and, um, you know, I was, I, I literally was quoting somebody late Mr. Rob today. I was talking about late Mr. Rob and, uh, um, like that ability to have a conversation with Victor Hugo and to be able to get into him was so like how I viewed it. I was like, I get to have conversations with the smartest people that have ever lived in history Mm -hmm. and to not do so is probably uh, a huge insult. Um, And then periodically things would happen or I'd get interviewed in some way where the, like the sports reporter would give me this like funny look. And I was playing for the Philadelphia Eagles and they asked me something one time and I was like, you know, I, um, after a bunch of reflection, I've come to one conclusion in the NFL. In the absence of true leadership, false prophets appear. So what happens is, is on an NFL team, if you do not have solid leadership, dudes just start prophesizing and just saying crazy shit like, ah, oh, everybody get up. And they'll like just basically false prophets. And I said that to uh, a reporter and he like looked at me like, what the fuck are you talking about? My like, false prophets. We have a lot of false prophets because there's not this place is absence of true leadership. And, uh, you know, and then another time they interviewed me and they said, you know, how do you feel running on the field? And I told the guy, uh, Ave Cesar Morituri Te Salutant, which is really the only Latin I remember, which is Hail Caesar. Those of us that die are about to salute you is what the gladiators would say on the steps of the Coliseum, you know, before they they went to battle. And uh, the guy like took a fucking double take and was like, good thing I got that on tape. And like, you know, so like periodically I would drop some stuff in there. Um, But I think... The one thing that was very impactful for me, um, and I don't know if it's a good thing or a bad thing, but I'll, I'll, I'll tell people constantly when they ask me, like, you know, like whether that like quips or get into little things or like, oh, you're you're pretty sharp on this stuff. And I tell them, well, you also didn't grow up with a really smart, condescending father the way that I did. My dad was like over 140 plus IQ and was extremely condescending because he was very smart and he didn't like 
he wasn't kind and gentle with his words. So like he was very condescending in a lot of ways. And I don't view it as a bad thing. I just viewed that he was preparing a bunch of young attorneys mm -hmm. and, you know, like a, a lot of coddling isn't what happened. So uh, whenever I get into stuff with people, I always tell them like, you didn't grow up with a dad with a, you know, who was a 55 year trial attorney, condescending father who was, uh, you know, like if you used improper grammar, he'd be, he's rolling in his grave right now, the fact that I'm using like and ums, he would like write me these handwritten letters and being like, you know, the other day on the phone, I noticed that you've really let your verbal skills. Oh, dude, it's crazy. He, uh, so my brothers and I joked and we'd call it the poison pen. I'd be like, hey, I got a poison pen from dad. And they were like, ooh, what did it say? I was like, um, like he just he would just eviscerate you in these written letters on things that you know like hey you're you're not doing this or this um i had we have a podcast on power theory radio we, we actually did a podcast with my dad he went back and listened to it and wrote me a poison pen letter that he would like a chance to redo the podcast because he did not feel prepared next time he wants a bunch of handwritten questions that he can pair ahead of time and he would like final say over the edits <laughs> and he would literally write these letters fold them up and he would mail them to you and you would get one and you'd be like, you could have told me this on the phone, but Savage. he had to write them. So, uh, he, he um, I, I, I learned everything, um, in this world about hard work and like dedication and family. I learned it from my mom and dad and playing football. Yeah. Um, I learned how to work within a team. I, 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 I realized that you can work with somebody that you don't like, but as long as you have a common goal to get there, I learned that you take care of your family. Um, you know, you have, a responsibility to prepare your children for the day that you're not there. And, um, you know, when my dad was sick with cancer, um, you know, we were taken to this place and he got diagnosed with stage four and they were going to try to do some treatments. And we, we like took him to this place with them to do a bunch of tests. And I like, we went my mom and she's like, let's go to a movie. And we ended up walking into the black, black Panther movie. Uh, don't mind me if I tear up, but, uh, uh, we just happened to walk in at the scene where like they bury him and he wakes up in the spirit world with his father and his dad says to him, the role of the father is to prepare the child for when the father's not there. Mm -hmm. And like, I realized uh, when my dad got sick, he was totally okay with it. And I asked him, like I was sitting there and I was like, dad, is there anything on your bucket list that you want to do? Like trying to give him some, like something to look forward to. Like we got to beat this thing. And everything on his bucket list was redoing stuff that he'd already done, but with us. Well, I went here and you guys weren't there. I want to go redo it. And uh, I told him, I'm like, dad, like, you, like, you know, uh, like, are you nervous about this? And he goes, no, I'm not nervous. And he goes, why? He goes, you guys are fine. You know, he's like, your older brothers, you like everybody's kicking ass. Like I did what I, I, I did the job that I was required to do when it's my time to go. I'm fine to go. Like, you know, can you imagine? And he even said, can you imagine being here sick and thinking that, you know, your your kids are a fuck up or this and that, you know, like nobody, you know, like who's going to take care of your mother and like feeling the stress of the house, like the house is paid for, there's money in the bank. Um, your brothers are all, you guys are all killing it. Like you guys are all super successful. You're all family guys. Like everybody's fine. He's like, as a father laying here in the situation, like that gives me comfort. And uh, that was really impactful. I mean, super sad to hear, but like, shit. So now I took that with whether it be with my company or who I am or having relationships like, you know, like with you, like, like don't half ass stuff. No. Um, I, I, I don't, um, I don't have endless amounts of friends, um, because I keep my circle really small. And when I meet new people, I kind of look at them and I'm like, mm, I don't know if this person fits within my, within my circle, but yet I meet people like, you know, when I met you and I was like, dude, you could be in my circle anytime. Yep. And it's because, uh, if, if I'm constantly pouring into your bucket, it's nice when people pour into mine and I feel like we get to share our water yeah. and I get to have a common experience. And I, I just get to be around people that make me better versions of myself and want to be better versions of myself. And uh, that was the great thing about playing in the NFL was that I had an opportunity to go out in front of millions of people and prove exactly how good or bad I was every Sunday. And there was always somebody to push me to be a better version because there were people depending on me. And, you know, I got to see it happen in real time. Every Sunday, white spandex, millions of people, exactly how good or bad and this and this. And um, it really forced me to sharpen my blade, try and do all the things I needed to do. And then you get out, you know, and then obviously you retire from the NFL. And, uh, you know, and then you go out into the real world. And, like, how do you continue to do that? Like, you know, people go to the gym and this. And I just, like... I, I held myself to a higher standard that I've continued to hold myself to. And um, I constantly, like, 
I don't think the word is ever disappointed because I'm never disappointed in people because I think you're only disappointed when you heavily invest. Um, but I realized pretty early on that, like, you know, um, uh, to not really expect a ton from people. Uh, like, you know, like you, I'm sure, George, you meet this all the time. And like, oh, if somebody calls you, if it doesn't, you're like, oh, I really wasn't expecting anything anyway. And then like, you know, if like the people that you let into your circle who you're really engaged with that you really like, and then something happens where you're like, damn, didn't see that one coming. And, you know, I'm sure this has happened to you where like people have hit you and you've been like, man, the only reason this thing's a little bit is because I actually cared and really valued you, you. And unfortunately, like you didn't turn out to be, you know, which is fine. You don't have to please me, but I think that you are not doing yourself a service. Mm -hmm. um, and that's where I go back to what we said earlier and that I'm, I'm a fan of the people I choose to be around. I'm a fan of humanity. I want to see you stand on the biggest stage and absolutely crush it. And I want to be in the crowd cheering your name and being there the first person to give you a high five. And when I see people not do that, um, it's not that it bothers me, but I want to like go and like tell them and being like, dude, you could do so much better. Like, and I want you to do better because I want you to be, you know, in the situation when hopefully, you know, I don't want anybody to die, but like you're laying on your deathbed feeling content. Like I did what I was supposed to do. Mm -hmm. I, I kept my seeds close. I sowed them. I did. And I was the person that people expected me to be and somebody that I'm happy with. Yeah. And, um, you know, when my dad passed there, you know, there was standing room only at his, uh, at his funeral and the amount of people that came over to me and told me stories about my dad, um, like to this day, I still tear up thinking about it. I mean, it was crazy mm -hmm. things he'd never told me that like somebody came over, like his Porsche mechanic that like my dad, like saved he and his wife and this and like all these things. This guy's telling me these stories. And I'm like, he calls me every year on uh, my dad's birthday. And it's like, you know, your dad was the most impactful person in my life. And I'm like, I didn't like, I, I didn't even know any of this. So, um, that's, what's important. And like, I think like you, you said it best, dude, uh, relationships, not algorithms. Mm -hmm. And, uh, I think the, you know, for me, I don't have a ton of relationships with people just because like my bandwidth, I just can't invest in everybody. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you, you, you seem to have an endless bandwidth <laughs> to invest in all these people. So I'm super <laughs> jealous of it. Um, but the people that are in my circle, um, they become like family yep. and I want them to do the best. And I, uh, I, I just have a genuine, um, just love for them and I want them to be better versions of themselves. So I'm constantly like read this and this, like I, I have a deal I do with my, uh, I have twin daughters and I said my one daughter, Jamie, she's, um, uh, my, my, my kids are smart. My daughter, Jamie's smart like my dad. And, uh, we think it skips generations. My dad was super smart. My nephew is like off the charts, like read it too. Like he's beyond smart. And, uh, um, so what I do is I'll, I'll send quotes to her. I'll just like uh, send her a quote, um, like a notepad. So she on Sunday, she has to get the quote and then she has to write about mm. it. So she's 11. And I was, she's like, well, what do I write? And I'm like, what does it mean to you? And I'm really fascinated to see like if I can uh, foster and develop her thought process by introducing her to some of the greatest thinkers on the planet. Whereas, um, you know, my dad... Uh, just expected us mm -hmm. to do that. Mm -hmm. And I think that expectation, and I always tell him like, you know, my dad was amazing, but he didn't necessarily like nurture this stuff the way that he could have. He had kind of sat down and been like, here's this thing. Like my dad was a fan of historical biographies. So he would sit down and tell me about Abe Lincoln and this, we'd have these conversations. And then I remember in college, I, um, I had a class, it was a, a rhetoric class on fear and I wrote on McCarthyism. Uh, and I called him and I was like, Hey dad, um, I got some questions on McCarthyism. You know, you remember Joseph McCarthy, the red scary. He's like, Oh yeah, I read a book on that. And he's like, you know, on page 159, there was this incredible passage and he kind of quoted me the passage. Uh, I had to go, I checked the book out and the book was written in like 1984. And, uh, my dad would still remember the passage. So he kind of had a photographic memory, but like, so we kind of engaged in that way, but I don't know if he nurtured us in the same way in that you know but also i was the youngest of three boys my dad worked an amazing amount of hours so it wasn't like he had the ability to text mm -hmm. and all the shit that we have now where i can you know basically text her a quote yeah. and then she can write it on notepad and share it with me and then we can have this kind of like go back and forth conversation yeah but um i really look at it like it's my responsibility to not only raise my children to be healthy and happy but also not hide the ugliness of the world but also teach them to think yeah. Uh, that's, you know, I have a master's in education. And the one thing that was most upsetting to me 
uh, doing analysis and looking at the way public schools are, is that we don't teach our children to think critically and we don't teach them to problem solve. They have to learn that at a much later date when it becomes. And if they could learn to problem solve and think and be able to like, hey, this is how I'm feeling, this is what I'm thinking, this is what I want to present, and then be able to have you know some form of honorable civil uh, discourse, we would not be in the problems that we're in today. Yeah. And more importantly, I, I don't think that people are comfortable talking about emotion as it relates to them because they can only live in their own sphere. Like my emotions don't affect you. So like, I don't expect you to be uh, like apathetic to everything. Like you don't have to have empathy in every way. And it's just, we're in such a really interesting thing because um, this is also with the argument thing. If all you do is go to the path or the pathos and it's just purely emotional, instantly people turn the fuck off. So if, and, and on social media, you hear this all the time where people are complaining and poor me and poor me by design, we instantly shut off if it's too much emotion, yep. right? If you hammer me with too many numbers, I figure you're a nerd. Yep. Shut up. Yep. Um, if, if, if it's numbers and emotion, but the person doesn't have ethos, just sounds like they're reading shit off of a screen. If all they do is talk about who they are, they're self-absorbed. Mm -hmm. So like the ability to move through those three and kind of seamlessly and tie them together and where, where this came from is really the, the foundation for my company, Power Athlete, and the technology that, that I teach is the fostering and developing of athleticism. So I viewed athleticism as like the greatest form of expression. Um, and it's something that when you see somebody do something that blows your mind, that's this great feat of athleticism, we know it just like when you see a pretty girl walk in the room. She might not be my type, but everybody knows she's pretty. You might hear a front engine V12 Ferrari pull up. And I'm not a Ferrari fan, but I know exactly what a V10 or a front engine V12 Ferrari sounds like because they tune it perfectly. Same with athleticism. You can watch Odell Beckham Jr. run down, rotate his body, catch with one hand. And he has this amazing catch that like breaks the internet and ESPN. And it was a great display of athleticism. What we don't see is the hundreds and thousands of times that he's practiced it and the effort. And so I went back and I had to define athleticism. So it's the ability to seamlessly and effortlessly combine primal movement patterns through space to accomplish a known or novel task. And from that definition, I was able to break it into pieces and teach people the components of athleticism. And then their ability to tie those components back together seamless and effortlessly is how we understand athleticism. And where this stems from was I was sitting on an airplane. I was, I was teaching a gig for Naval Special Warfare for the SEALs on the East Coast. And I was coming back. And, you know, the Navy always books you coach, mm -hmm. real classy. So I'm sitting in an exit seat, middle seat. And the dude sitting next to me is kind of like a younger, uh, maybe early 30s black dude, dreadlocks. And he's like looking at like a tablet and he's watching cut-ups. So the only people that have these type of cut-ups are either college or NFL scouts or players. Like they're literally side zone. Like they're, they're not TV cuts. And so you'll see side uh, sidelined end zone and he had all these cuts. And he was watching all these people. So I kind of like look over and watch. And he kind of like does one of these. And I watched a little bit. And then he switched and watched some college. And then, like, after about 20 minutes, he, like, uh, pulled off his headphones. He's like, what do you think? And I was like, that left tackle's dragging his foot, dude. He's laid on his punch. And he, like, looks at me, and he's like, you play college football? And I was like, I did play college football. So we go a little bit farther, <laughs> and uh, he was asking me a little bit. And then he uh, uh, later – and then he goes to me, he goes, did you play in the NFL? And I was like, I did play in the NFL. And then he goes, what's your name? And so I tell him, John Wilborn, uh, come to find out that he's one of the scouts for the Rams. And he's like, holy shit, where you been? I used to scout you. You're a fucking badass. What are you doing sitting in coach? And I'm like, uh, I work, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm teaching a, a seminar. I'm doing some contracting for the Navy, and this is how they sent me back. And so um, uh, the uh, – hey, it's so, so cheap. So imagine me stuck in this middle seat. So then we start rapping a little bit, and he goes, closes his tablet, and he goes, I got a question for you. Do you think it's possible to fool somebody into being a better player and more athletic than they really are? And I was like, 100 percent it is. Yeah. He said, we, we had this kid that we drafted first and we thought he could do all these things. And all of a sudden we got him out and he can't play dead in the NFL. And we're thinking he's a loss. And so he started showing me, showing me tape. And I was like, he can't move in space. It's this. And they're like, well, he was able to do this and this. And I told him the components of athleticism. And the movements, which really involve like hinging, stepping, and stepping up X, Y, and Z axis. You can put it, you can plot it on this. The ability to tie X, Y, and Z axis through space to accomplish a known or novel task like pass blocking. If you give me enough repetition and enough opportunity to do it, and you coach me into perfection, 
I can do it. Where we see athleticism happen in real time is when now all of a sudden somebody does something outside the realm of what I've been preparing for. And now it forces me outside to my margins, pushes me to the edge. And the problem is, is the NFL, the guys he's going against are so gifted that you have to have an innate athleticism. You, you don't have to have a storied athleticism. You have to have something extra. And what you guys saw is he fooled you into thinking he was more athletic than he was. But then you put him against the world's best and it extends his margins and he had any fails. Mm. And um, that initial talk and the way I explained it, I wrote down and I went back and crafted this definition. And it really became the technology for my company was basically making people better versions of themselves by fostering developing athleticism. But I also took the same approach in terms of teaching and education and knowledge um, that I can teach somebody to think if you give me the opportunity, if we have enough. I mean, the way the Greeks did it, right? What do they do? They, they, they sat around. You know, you see the pictures of them sitting on the steps around this and presenting and arguing and this. They did it in discourse. Um, they did it by reading and writing and presenting and here and they fell into little clicks. But that only happened based upon and we'll go to a Bible. You know, iron sharpens iron as one man sharpens another. Mm -hmm. It doesn't happen in an echo chamber. You know, you sitting here and thinking of all these things are great, but it requires you to be the straw in your drink to go out and present this and hear this in real time and have this interaction. Because at the end of the day, uh, you know, um, my dad uh, used to drop quotes on me all the time. And uh, he I, I think many of them he made up. And he told me, he said, you know, um, uh, something I, I asked him something. He's like, you know, you want to avoid in life. I was like, what's that? And I was like, herpes. And I made some joke. He's like, don't ever hold your fan, uh, your fan club meetings in a phone booth. <laughs> He said, you know, you're, uh, he said, you know, like basically like don't ever, like if you can hold your fan club meetings in a phone booth, we got real fucking problems. And like, I'm, I'm totally butchering the quote, but uh, it was really funny. And I meet people constantly. I think to myself, I'm like, this guy holds his fan club meetings in a phone That's booth. That's such a good one. He's his, yeah. He's, a, he's his biggest fan. And I, I never want to be my own biggest fan. Like I, I never want to be the guy who's all by myself in the phone booth being like, hurrah, hurrah, you know, hear how great I am. No, no, no. I want to push myself out there. I want to like introduce myself. Like this is, this is such an amazing opportunity to be on this podcast. Um, you know, not only because I get to connect with my friend and sit around and talk, um, which I feel like we don't really ever get that chance because, you know, at the seminar or at the event you taught, you know, all these people and you're kind of the ringleader and there's all these people and you're trying to split this. And you know what? I don't view it as any other. Uh, I view it exactly in the way that I should, which is this is his event. He has to invest his time with these people because they need the George experience. Mm -hmm. And me selfishly taking that away from him, I've already had the George experience. Mm -hmm. These people need their moment. Mm -hmm. And you have to give everybody. Do you remember the movie? Um, and I know I'm skipping around the way oh, my no. brain works. I got you. But, but do, you, do you remember the movie Almost Famous? Yes. When the guy looks, he's like, I look for the one guy who's not getting off. And I get him off. And you can print that. <laughs> and uh, like like that, that was like the... The, the fucking pregame movie for all of our seminars, almost famous, right? Yep. Like you find the one guy who's not getting off and you get him off. And you know what? That's what it is. You have to find you everybody, make a connection, create a bridge and have them their moment. And if it's them telling you a story or you connecting, uh, I think you have, well, you have to do it, but it has to be genuine. It does. And because the, because and, and as you know, George, I'm sure you've, you've met people where like, you know, like you meet somebody who's super impactful and then you talk to them and there's nothing on the other side and feels disingenuous and they're uninterested. Mm -hmm. And you're kind of like, like, uh, maybe they had a bad day, but at the end of the day, you feel let down. You're like, man, that was such an amazing thing. Like, um, you know, I'm sure with, with sports guys, like, Oh my God, I met Tom Brady and I saw him do this. And it was such a magical moment. And you meet him and he's like, get the fuck out of my way, kid. And you're like, uh, you know, not that Tom does that. He's, uh, he, he's extremely gracious yeah, and has always been a wonderful, very, very, very friendly and extremely gracious to me. Um, but I think you have the opportunity to influence everybody that you meet mm -hmm. in a positive or negative way. And I'm not selfish enough to derail that or take that from somebody. Yeah. So here's how I summarize this. Cause I, I love this. So earlier when you were talking about like your daughters and seeing it and like when I'm in the room, right. And, and those moments are happening, which by the way, laughing moment, like kind of break the fourth wall for everybody listening, but on day one, so somebody asked me after the event, John, that we were reflecting on day three, one of my friends, he's like, okay, cool. So like, why did you say this? Like, why did you say that? I'm like, listen, day one is really easy. 
I have two jobs. One is get everybody in the room mentally, physically, emotionally, spiritually, because they are not in the room when they walk in there, right? I need to get them fully present to current state. And then he's like, uh-huh. And I was like, then I have to offend 20% of the audience. And he's like, why? And I was like, because I don't do the almost famous line. I just make them raise their hands for me. And so I just wait and I wait. And I remember I said something. And I was like, please let this be the one. And then the hand went up and she's like, I'm triggered. And I was like, and I remember I turned and I was like, thank God it took long enough. And everybody laughed. Yeah. And I was like, no, 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 no. I'm being so honest with you right now that I really meant that word. And, um, <clears throat> you know, in thinking through the pathos, Lago, the, the, the three that I can never remember. <clears throat> it's uh, ethos, pathos, and logos. logos. Ethos, pathos, pathos, and logos. And, pathos and logos. Yep. In thinking through them, right? And, and I, I, I want to call out a lot of what you said. Um, for me, what it comes down to and not knowing them, when I felt the most in alignment is when I'm fully aware of like my own integrous relationship with myself, like how I really feel, like how I see the world. And when you start there from that place of observation of self, then basically the three of them are in alignment as long as you stay true to what you find, right? And even if you don't have clarity on something, rather than pretending to acknowledge that you don't have clarity on the thing, but still share the thing, right? And I have to give full credit to fucking Tucker Max. We were at his house one night. We were probably six bottles of wine deep together at the dinner table, his kids running around naked on the counter. Veronica's like, you two are out of fucking control. And we're laughing about something. And he's like telling me to write a book. And he asked me about the story. And I started crying telling the story. And I was either drunk or emotional, but either way. And he's like, oh, fucking conversation over. And I was like, what do you mean? And he's like, you can't write a book you're in the middle of. And as simple as it, oh, wow. as simple as it was, over the next couple of months, I started to think about it in the lens of how I did my content. <clears throat> and I was like, okay, if I have an emotional charge around my story, all I'm going to say is I'm experiencing this with you. If I have no emotional charge, all I'm going to say is I experienced this and here's how I'm going to help you. And it allowed me to be radically integrous and honest about my experience all the time without feeling any pressure to say like, hey, you should do this. Or I'm like, no, no, no. I'm doing this with you. Like I'm in the middle of this shit storm with you, but I just wanted to acknowledge it, which allowed me to keep true to those three in like how I wanted to operate my behaviors. <clears throat> and so the reason I say this, John, is what I've been thinking about is in the frustrations of all my old coaching versus the effectiveness of what I have now. And this is the only difference. The paradox of leadership for me is that like when I meet somebody and they ask me a question, I can crystal clearly see their training plan in my brain broken down into segments that has a crystal clear path for their success. Just like you can, when you see an athlete, you instantly yeah. see it and you're like, yep, quarter one, month one, block one, do this, change this. Like it is crystal clear. I used to get really frustrated because I would see it and I'm like, don't you see it? Like you don't see it. And then I read the book, The Catalyst by Jonah Berger and the chapter on distance and the movable middle specifically. And so what I call the paradox of leadership now is that when I see the 30 steps, the only way I win is if I tell them about only the first one. The hardest part mm. for my day is having restraint. And I think about it like those movies where you go into the future and they're like, you can't see anybody and say anything because you're going to change their destiny. And so mm -hmm. I that's what it feels like now. And so I feel like because I know this, I remove the attachment to any step and I just make invitations. And so it doesn't feel like a lot of energy to like invest in because I'm like, I see the path for all of you. I'm just holding it. So whenever you're ready, like, hey, take a step, like, hey, take a step. And so it's been interesting for me because the moment I remove the attachment to like my clients or the people in the room, like for example, at the event after day one, my team's debrief and they're like, Hey, that blonde woman in the corner, Shelly, she looks angry. She's, I feel like she's going to leave the event. Like, I feel like tomorrow you should do blank. And I was like, or Shelly's having the exact experience she's about to have. And if you pay attention by the third morning, she'll be the first one to raise her hand. And they're like, yeah, 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 whatever. Right. And then by the third morning, Shelly's hand is like dead ass up in the air. Um, but if we were to jump in and be like, well, let's go get Shelly, then Shelly would be reactant 
and defensive and potentially deep in the wound a little bit more. So it's just an interesting perspective that I see that I don't talk about often, but you know, I think about it with your daughter because you're like, Hey, I want to teach you how to think, but instead of giving you, you know, meditations by Marcus Aurelius, here's, yeah, it's too much. here's one quote. Hey, let me know how you think about this quote. And so when I think about customer journeys, when I think about coaching, when I think about the events, like that's how I break them down to not have the attachment to all of it and then let that step go. So it's just an interesting reflection. I love it. I love it. Yeah. When, uh, when I designed the methodology, uh, for power athlete, um, you know, everything works from what I call the said principle, which is specific adaptation to impose demands. That's kind of the end state. And then what I do is I work backwards on everything and what very, what like pivots, the really the training, the movements, everything is specificity, mm -hmm. um, which is like, for example, um, like, let's say somebody has to work, like I've been working with these professional Brazilian Jiu Jitsu guys, yeah. you know, they do a lot of pulling. Um, if all of a sudden, like I see the elbows start to like bend and they're getting to a shitty position, we'll go pick up a 150, 200 pound sandbag and I make them do isometric contractions to fatigue their arms. If they continue to bend their arms, we'll go to a fat bar. Mm. Uh, and then if they continue this, then we'll go to a trap bar. And then like, if they're struggling in this, I, I end up pivoting the training because I have it broken into like yep. X, Y, and Z axis and these like bigger picture. I need them to hinge. I need them to load. I need them to be able to do this and this. And like, you know, there's a direct correlation between percentage of one RM and which part of the brain it activates. Mm. So if I lift like 60 to 65% and they've done this with brain mapping, it's lower part. When all of a sudden I get over like 70 to 75, 80%, it's a middle. Once I start getting over 85, 90 uh, to 100, it starts activating the top part of their brain where like all the decision matrices really become home. Mm. So I need those guys to be top level thinking and I need them to be activating that heart of the brain, which requires them to lift heavy weights, which requires them to be switched the fucking on. And we have to be able to get to that point. So there's certain intensities and certain things that I need them to do in the training, not only for like a physical kind of structural development, I need their connective tissues and the muscles and the bones and Wolf's Law and all that, but there's also some neurological effects. Like for example, we do some really nasty Tabata assault, uh, echo bike oh. protocols. Oh. And, uh, like, uh, it's, yeah, I, I, I have this whole, basically this, uh, what I call becoming superhuman, uh, protocol where I can pretty much, if you go through the protocol, the way I've done it, your physical aerobic capacity is so fucking high that you will never fatigue. It's, uh, it's basically like how, uh, like I've, I've been working this thing offline and I've been testing on these guys. There's some supplementation of like creatine beta alanine. It's basically how to become fucking Superman. And, um, what will happen is after, you know, the first, first set of eight that they get off the bike, what I do is I either attack them and they have to fight or we have to spell, or I'll give them, uh, math questions and this, and like, I kind of like gauge them like, okay, four plus four. Okay. How do you spell your name backwards? And then if they don't answer, I fucking basically smash them and we start grappling. And what I need them to do is I need them even in a fatigue state to be able to use that higher order in their brains. And so we constantly do it. Um, you know, there's some chaos method. I mean, so, uh, what was really nice is I've, I, I have thousands of people in our paid programs, uh, in our training programs that I get to use as guinea pigs and we run different stuff. And, uh, you know, um, I've loved to, you know, really where I uh, would love to take it is to be able to get 100,000 people in there. And I realized that the ability for me to go to five to 7,000 to get to 50 to 70 is probably somewhere in the realm of George Bryan and understanding customer journey and emails and all this <laughs> other stuff, which which at the end of the day, I, I really love, like we talked about the technical aspect of it. I'm just not the person to run shotgun on this stuff. I like I need to like, I, I like, I, it's funny. I was talking to her, to my team and I um, was going through all this stuff and they just were like, and I'm like, Oh, God damn it. These aren't the right people. These aren't the droids I'm looking for. I need to find better droids. And it's, it, it, it's not anything like a rip on them in any way, but I think like, you know, you did, you said something so impactful to me uh, when we talked about employees, like you have people for a season, you have reason, for, season or lifetime know. and the decision isn't yours. Yeah. Yeah. And it's so true. Like, you know, like um, not everybody helps you get to the same place. Like, you know, there's people that, you know, we call it, um, oh, fuck, what is it? It's uh, um, explorer pioneer city builder i think is the way we looked at mm. it like there's a guy that can just show up and like build a fire then there's some other guys that can create a little community and then you need a city planner to do this like you need different people at different points and i think like 
you know, for me to be able to, you know, be able to make the next jump in this information because I live so much in this, like, like, and it's not even content creation as much as it's just like understanding the system. Like if I can like plug in and like plug this information into people like, uh, like physical greatness and more importantly, but here's the thing too. Um, and this is another thing that I really struggle with. I always go back to like the ancient Greeks where it was, you know, like you were, um, a politician and an order, you were a fighter, you were a warrior, a warrior, you were a lover, you were a thinker, this idea of being like a complete human. And I think what's been so upsetting in, in recent times is everybody wants people so siloed, like, okay, you're just this marketing entrepreneur guy, but you're so much more than that. You know, you're an athlete, you're a father, you're this, I mean, and you know what, like we should celebrate people that are complete humans. Mm -hmm. And I only want to be around people that are complete humans. I don't want to be around people that are like, partial humans mm -hmm. that are, you know, this guy's really good at marketing, but his life's a shit show and this and this, and he's an alcoholic and he's into drugs and he steals money, but he's okay at this. And it's like, I don't want to be around those people. I, I want to be around complete humans that um, I get to learn from that sharpen my blade. And more importantly, I can sit there and be both a student and a mentor. And, um, you know, like I, I always love at my seminars where I got up where somebody gave me honest feedback on how to improve what I was doing. Um, I like years ago, um, I was uh, revamping a nutrition aspect, like so the nutrition stuff was kind of uh, a little wonky. And I reached out to a friend of mine, Matt Lalonde. I don't know if you remember Matt Lalonde. I He's do. a Harvard PhD. Yep. So I invited Lalonde to come out and uh, come take the seminar. And so the night before the seminar, we went to like a birthday party for a friend of ours at the gym and we were driving home. And it was pretty late, like 10 o'clock, 11 o'clock at night. So I come in, he stayed at my house and like all of a sudden I'm like, okay, you know, seminar starts pretty early. He sits down in the chair and he's like, give me your nutrition seminar. I'm ready to hear it. And I was like, right now it's like 10 o'clock, 11 at night. He's like, fucking, uh, what, what you're just going to do it. Like the first time I hear it is going to be tomorrow. That's the, no, 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 do it right now. And so I, I was like, fuck it, do it. So uh, basically pulled out like a, a big piece of paper, put it on the wall. And I basically gave him my talk at 11 o'clock at night in, in our, in, in, uh, we we're living in this little beach house, just in the family room. He fucking ev eviscerated me. You can't say that. You got to say this and this. And about two or three in the morning, we pretty much created uh, what I know is the power athlete diet based on nutrient density. It's based off of this and this, and like, just really this idea of like, now it's become very sexy to be like, Oh, you should only focus on protein. Yeah, no, we were fucking yeah. basically been beating this drum for a number of years, you know, the eating the most nutrient dense diet, looking at micronutrients, this reducing gut inflammation. I mean, created this like fucking impenetrable approach to nutrition. And, uh, he was like, I'm ready to go to sleep now. And we went to sleep. Uh, or, uh, we got up the next morning, went to the seminar day two, got up and gave it. I had him get up and talk and he got up and spoke for a few minutes and he's like, I want to hear John give the talk that we worked on. And so I got, I got, I, I stood up and I gave it and he was like, you're now bulletproof. Anybody who shows up to this thing, I don't care if they're fucking holy God themselves will not be able to fucking literally shoot a, an arrow at you. Your armor is fucking but And he fucking certified me in that way. And I really took that interesting piece of like, um, if I'm going to educate people or I'm going to arm them and whatever it is, I have to make sure that the information is, is not only the best I can provide them. I have a responsibility to, you know, remove all the chinks in the armor. Make it bulletproof, and I think man. that was make it bulletproof, which is what you did so well at your event with uh, both customer journey and the emails and how you put it all together. It is so well thought out and so methodical and action based and just like shut the fuck up and just implement it as I'm, as I'm telling you and you'll be fine. Yeah. And like to the point where I'm like, it can't be this easy. And you're like, it's that fucking easy. It can't be this easy. It's that fucking yeah. easy. And, uh, and, and like, it, it's like this, like the same thing we do with training and nutrition where it's like, Hey dude, if you want to have big, strong muscles, you have to move heavy weights. If you want yep. to be athletic with big, strong muscles, you have to move heavy weights very fast, like very dynamically, very explosively using compensatory acceleration. If you want to be big and strong and be really healthy, like here's a, uh, like the diet that's like, you know, that we put together, it's really the one that we use, um, you know, and then there's kind of these different levels for it. The problem is, is that the, the person that gets millions of clicks is the fucking idiot liver king who's over there fucking consuming raw testicles. Yeah. And people think that like that level of insanity is the road at which you take to success. And 
I just think it takes you to the fucking road of, you know, Barnum and Bailey, where you're just a fucking circus addict. Yeah. And, uh, you know, I'm, you know, am, am I, am, you know, it's the, uh, you know, am I here to fucking amuse you? No, I don't want to be, you know, uh, Maximus de Aurelius fucking standing there trying to amuse people. Mm -hmm. Like, I am, um, I'm not a fucking clown. And I think what was very nice was not, I mean, um, and what was amazing at your event was so well done was, um, there was humor in this and like you're wearing pink boots, which is just so funny to me. <laughs> um, but the origin story is amazing. You're like, they only made one pair. Timberland made one and I got them, yep. uh, which, which just instantly like gives credibility to it because this is your pink. And just like, uh, even down to like, we were sitting there, you're like, close your eyes. And like, you had that song that was like, I'm good enough. Yep. And I started, I started laughing and then I listened and the girl next to me was crying hysterically which all of a sudden made me feel like an <laughs> asshole that I was going to laugh. And I was like, shut the fuck up, John, don't laugh. But like, I, uh, so it was uh, like, you have to take people on a journey. Yeah. Like there's this like road of like, uh, I don't know shit. And I'm taking you to this, like, you know, influence where now I understand. And then you bring them into the family. And you do it really well. I, um, it, it, it was, it was really nice to see. And, uh, we had an event this weekend for our block one coaches, which, uh, we, we have an online thing through our methodology. And then once they pass the methodology, they can come and actually test for their block, which is this metal blocks that I weld. And um, I make every one and they have to basically come and not only they have to write, so they have to present the information in a written form. They have to sit around a table, do a Socratic method, and then they have to actually go teach and show that they can you know, influence and take an athlete on this journey. And then there's some other little things that we do. Um, but uh, like I, I wouldn't want anybody to carry our flag and more importantly, carry our banner that had gone through some crucible that had proved that they could do it. I never wanted to do something disingenuous and probably that hurts me financially because it'd be easier just to paper people up and let them run wild. But then again, like I think you get into something that CrossFit got into where all of a sudden it became a punchline on South Park because they didn't have quality control. Yeah. So there's like this interesting thing of like, I want to be successful but I don't want to do it at the, like, I'll just use the liver king because we talked about him earlier. Like, okay, I'm, I'm sure that dude made a hundred million dollars in a supplement company, but it, at what point? At what cost? At what cost? Yeah. Like forever, you're going to be this absolute fucking cartoon character. Even if you shave your beard, people hear your name. They're going to be like, oh, Jesus. Like 25 years from now, they're going to have your picture in the dictionary next to ridiculous. Yep. And you're forever a fucking clown. Like, like what is that? I mean, yep. yeah, I mean, the money's great. He can shave his beard and move to fucking Costa Rica. Nobody knows who he is. Or maybe they will. Yeah. But at the end of the day, like, is like, did he impact people in a positive way? He claims he did. But then all of a sudden, he, you know, like he, he lied to all these people. He said probably in a class action lawsuit. So mm -hmm. I don't know, man, like the balance of like marketing as an honest person which I'm sure you've been approached with a lot of disingenuous shit, you know, dishonest stuff over the years. And you're like, yeah, but then that destroys my credibility and my brand to be associated well, with. Well, because it just took me, it took me a decade to realize that actually I'm protecting my financial interests by choosing to stay aligned, right? It's just my measurement window was too short and I didn't see the result yet. But now that I've been doing it for so long, it is the most financially rewarding position as well, but you just have to have patience, which requires you to be fully integrated into the triad or the three prong approach of your ethos, pathos and logos. And so that's, yeah. that's really, you know, for me, it's cause like, you know, at the end of the day, like I was just, I I've had three clients here in the last five days and I've put them all through the ringer. And I basically am like, no, like I'm, I'm writing your religion for you. Like, this is not your mm -hmm. business. This is not your office. Like, this is this is who you are. And from that place, everything works. But like, when I, like, the core of what I do is I genuinely believe in my soul that every single human being I meet is my customer. I really believe that. Mm. And I can't, I've yet to meet a human that I, that I can't fit into the bucket of either customer journey, mindset, or relationships. And so then my job is to ensure that every person I meet, I just have one next step to give them that has nothing to do with me. That's only about them getting closer to their goal. And so like, I look at this now because obviously in the short game, I win. Someone's like, well, I don't want to read the book. Can I just pay you? Sure. Give me a hundred grand. Right. But then the ones that go read the book, like every day I meet 10, 12, 13, 14 people and I send out at least six to seven resources a day. Baristas, lumber yard, gym, sauna, you name it. 
it's out there. And then a year later, the phone rings and a year and a half later, I'm in Congress and a year and a half later, I'm on an NFL team. And I'm like, it's the only way. And so Mm -hmm. for everybody listening, trust me, it's the only way. Like the reason I read The Go-Giver once a month and my buddy Bob and David wrote it, like it's the Bible. It's the only way. And man, you like live it, man. Like I, I, uh, I'm inspired. Like everything that you said is echoed back. Like, you know, those conversations with you and, and him in your apartment, like, God, I can tell you how exhausted Matt and Bonnie were when I had them in their office till 1 a.m. And I'm like, no, listen to me. Now is the time. We're not going to bed. I'm fixing it now. Like those moments with my friends, man, are like every core memory I have of like entrepreneurship, like Jim Quick's apartment at 1 a.m. designing the podcast and Matt here. And then the ones that have done it for me, like that's, that's it. Like you, you are forever, like in, in my top nine and in my inner circle forever. But I think there's such Thank a you. lesson for everybody listening as well, because I look at what you do and how, you know, besides all the bullshit you say when you're hard on yourself and you pre-qualify your conversations, you know, and all the bullshit you do to, you know, stand against your own ethos on the podcast. But besides that stuff, um, <laughs> you know, for my subtle jabs, for my big brother over there, but you know, um, you know, besides that, like you're a master at what you do. And I look at, I look at where you are and the stories that I've heard and the people that I met. And by the way, the small world between us, the more it expands and the more I bump into people, I'm like, really you too? Fuck. And John and I didn't meet till we were with some, you know, man, boy producer. Yeah. Okay. Got it. Um, yeah. But I just think about a lot of the things you shared about like proximity, like who you spend your time with. And then like this undertone this whole time is that, you know, I heard this through everything you said of like this, this obsession with like an integrous relationship with self, right? Where like the delayed gratification that comes from being a professional athlete, right? Like it doesn't matter how you played last Sunday. All that matters is what you're doing today to see how you play next week, right? And like, for those listening to this, if you go listen to this again, (laughs) the amount of principles and fortune cookies that are floating around underneath this podcast are like kind of massive. And so, um, John, for me, just, and I should have done this earlier, but there are so many places. Your podcast is incredible. Your social is incredible. Like, can you kind of give everybody the rundown? We're going to be doing like 10 more of these podcasts. So it doesn't really matter. You know, you'll say it a hundred more times, but just so everybody kind of can get a taste of John Wellborn. Yeah, no, I'm easy to get a hold of. It's just at John Wellborn on social and Twitter, uh, Instagram. I, um, uh, I'm not as good on social media as I should be. And it's mainly because uh, I am running 100 miles an hour. I I have this weird obsession of trying to collect skills. And uh, like I I weld and I fabricate and I build trucks. I like uh, bought a like a a cat track loader and I'm trying to like, you know, grade our property and cut wood and like, um, you know, raise my kids. And I, you know, uh, you know, a buddy of mine. Uh, who's uh, was a college wrestler, you know, has been followed, you know, across at football. It's like, hey, I need a training partner. So we train at 6 a.m. every morning. Um, I took on, you know, working with uh, these professional Brazilian jiu-jitsu kids because they are the nicest kids and they need me. And um, they're super just amazing humans, but they also train my kids and they're like family. And I like, um, so I, I wish I could clone myself. Um, I, so I like, there's a lot of things and I need to read. I need to write. I need to like, there's a million things. And, uh, I run a company and I, uh, I, yeah, it's a, it, it's a, it, it's a full life. I have an amazing wife, um, who, you know, uh, is extremely dedicated to everything as well. So, um, you know, and then I have amazing friends and I, I think that's why I keep my circle pretty, pretty tight. And I'm sure George, you've mm-hmm. met people that I know, but like, I just, um, I don't have the ability to invest what I want to and as many people as I want to. So I tend to like as best as much as I can, but, um, man, I wish there were more hours in the day to be able to do more stuff. But I, um, you know, and you're one of those people that I wish I got to hang out with a hell of a lot more. It's funny. I, I talked to Rob Wolf the other night, Rob called me or I, I called Rob on something. And so I talked to him from like nine to 11. I'm sitting in my car, like my kid, like my wife just like turned off all the lights and I'm sitting out there talking to Rob and, uh, um, you know, Rob is, probably one of my best friends in the world. And, you know, when they they lived down the road here in Texas, we didn't, you know, we did not get, like, we saw them maybe a few times a month. It wasn't like every day because it was, you know, it's a 90 minute drive, but man, like, I really wish I got to see them more. And every time I'm better for being around Rob, but like, you know, as we were, you know, he's having this uh, like 
bison event in September. I, I want to get up to, and I told him, I'm like, you know, I'm supposed to go to one of George's events. I, I, I can't wait to get up there and see you guys. Um, and Rob's like, I, I miss you, dude. I'm like, I miss you too, dude. You're one of my best friends. And I feel like as we get older and mm-hmm. we kind of, and George, you've seen this as you get down the path, like not everybody gets a chance to stick, but like if people stick for a while, they become family yep. and it's because they better you and they sharpen that blade. And when you, and you talk to them and you ask them questions and, um, and they just, you know, have such a good interaction. And I, um, you know, and then you, and then you have other people that were important to just kind of like move on. Yeah. And, uh, I, I'm never, I'm never sad about that. Uh, but you know what? I realized that like, not every person is the right person every moment in your life or their life. And like certain people are like, you know what? I'm, I don't mean it in a, in a negative way, like social climbers in a lot of ways where, you know, they called you or maybe you interacted with them because you were the right person at that moment, mm-hmm. but then they meet somebody better. It's almost like a spirit guide. Yep. Like all of a sudden, like, Hey, this person is able to, you know, fits into this bucket and helps me better. Dude, I'm not mad about that. As long as you're moving forward, that's all I care about. Yeah, yeah, it's and I, I, I I think people feel like, oh, that person left me behind, and I'm like, nobody gets left behind. If anything, all that all all that happens is um, it's like a merry-go-round. Like, no, but it'll come back around. The next thing you know, you'll be like, I knew we were friends for a reason. Yeah, you know that kind of deal. Oh yeah, dude. When that shaman said that to me, it collapsed like 25 years of suffrage for me. When he looked me dead in the eye and he's like, your biggest problem is you don't understand that relationships happen for a reason, a season, or a lifetime, and the decision is not yours. And I was like, poof. And like to think back now, like I had one of my former social media managers get fired, didn't speak, and then came back as my CEO 18 months later. I had, wow. you know, like I, I have hundreds of these where like my my coach then became my enemy, then became my friend, and then became my client. And then, like, it's mind blowing to me to think about. But it's it's really, really. There's a lot of power in the simplicity of that statement, and it's it's really, really cool. Yeah, no, it's um, uh, I think the the best thing to do in life, and I know this is going to sound shitty, is to kind of qualify people very quickly. And I think you do a, probably a really good job of, of this. And I, I, I think I do mm-hmm. too. Um, I qualify people very quickly, wh- whether or not their desire to be friendship or enter into the circle is to benefit them mm-hmm. or to benefit the circle. Yep. And I'm sure, sure, George, you've had people that are just like humping your knee 24-7. Oh, yeah. And it's just because just they, they want shit. Mm-hmm. And they view you as like the person that can get them. And then the minute, like if you help them or do what they need, you never hear from them yep. again. They're like the age old person that like hump your knee with like, Hey, I need you to do this and this and this. And you're like, great. And then you ask them and it's fucking crickets yep. and you're like, okay, you get put on the pay no mind list yep. and I'm happy to do it. Yep. Uh, and they do nothing to fill your bucket. And, um, you know, I don't view it as a negative thing. No. I just, uh, I just kind of avoid them because they're just energy vampires. Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, that shit kills me. Yeah. Oh, for sure. Yeah. And the thing, um, you should come up to Rob since we're neighbors and I bump into him at the gym about once a quarter. Um, just small world that we happen to live near each other in one of your favorite places on the planet. So, Oh, I, I love it. It's it, well, it's funny when, um, when we were moving out of California, I lobbied for whitefish Kalispell area because, uh, my mom's from Lethbridge, yep. which is just, a, 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 a border. over in Canada. Yep. And then we would fly in uh, and stay in Whitefish, and then we would drive up and go to the Calgary Stampede and Lethbridge and all that in Calgary. Uh, and then my aunt and uncle lived in Edmonton, and then everybody moved to you know Vancouver, and then you know Vancouver Island and Victoria and Nanaimo, and so uh, Canada is very like uh, close to me. And Derek Woodsky lives up there too. So, um, but uh, yeah, no, I, I do love that part of the world. Um, but my wife doesn't like the cold. Yeah, no, I got it, so. man. I got it. I got it. <laughs> so, so, so we we live here in Texas. But I, I keep telling my wife this is not my final resting place. Yeah. Uh, I, I I either need to see mountains or ocean. Yeah. And if I could mix it like half and half, where I could see mountains and then the other half of the of the world, like live in Montana, see see mountains, and the rest of the year live in like Costa Rica and see ocean. Yep. I'd be ecstatic. Yeah, I think I think we'll get you there. Uh, I have a solution to your customer journey things, but I'm still working on a challenge of the staffing thing. And then um, I am going to see you more because I uh, 
just got an apartment in Austin with Gel Blaster. Oh, so sweet. Um, it, yeah, we realized how much money we were spending for me to stay like nine grand in a hotel a month. And I'm like, we can just get me a bomb <laughs> place and then other people can use it. So they finally we finally got smart there. So I'll be there a lot more often and we'll do another one of these in person and, and hang out and Oh yeah. I I, I look forward to it, man. It's um, uh, it, it, it's always nice. Like I said, dude, it's always really nice to be around people that sharpen your blade. And it's always nice to be around people where you feel uh, as much um, a student yeah. and, you know, can learn from. And like that is, um, I, I think um, if I could ever give anybody, and I always think like with a podcast, like you always should give people like some nugget to walk away from. I mean, obviously, we, well, I was going to ask you to leave with there. one. So I'll take yours now because it's perfect. <laughs> Um, I think, um, you know, the idea of, of always be in a learning mindset, always be willing to be a white belt, always be willing to humble yourself and to walk into something where you're not the master and learn from somebody better. And like that, like, uh, the age old Bruce Lee, um, you know, empty your cup. Yep. If your cup is full, I can't fill it. And just being able to humble yourself and always be a student. And I really have always looked at like any, any time I'm reading any of the great thinkers, um, I'm like their student and taking in their information. We're having a conversation. I'm, I'm there to absorb the information as a student. Um, and I think so many times, especially in the, in the space that we're kind of in, which is an interesting one, there's this feeling that I have to be the master at all times. Like, uh, like, you know, this entrepreneurial space, like I'm the, you know, like I'm the fucking black belt, I'm the coral belt and I'm going to stand up here and everybody fucking bows to me. And I think it's, uh, it's disingenuous. Yeah. And I, th I think it gets extremely heavy, um, to, to have to always wear that crown. And, um, I, I'm more than happy to sit there and like, talk to people and, and learn from them and learn what they have to you know provide and more importantly, learn the lessons that they think I need to learn. And I think if I'm always in that growth mindset and always within that learning, um, just have that learning potential. I, I, I don't view anything as outside reach. I view it as kind of limitless. And, um, you know, I, I, I run into people constantly that have such a fixed mindset and I almost like run into them and I almost pivot immediately where I'm like, but fixed mindset mm -hmm. doesn't want to learn time to go. Mm -hmm. And I, I just don't want to be around those people. I want to be around like intelligent, vibrant people that can like move between these different energies and that they can be the teacher and the master and be able to be like, Hey dude, um, this is something amazing you can teach me, but here's how something I can really help you. Cause I'm really good at this. Yeah. And I think like this energy is fun. And at the end of the day, I want all my friends to kill yep. it because I'm a, I'm, I'm, I'm a fan of the circle and like, I'm a fan of the people just like me, like sitting there fucking cheering for yeah. you. I wanted to see you stand on that stage and do exactly what you did. And when you did it, I could not have been more proud to not only call you my friend, but also to be in the audience, seeing it happen. And I felt like I had to validate it in some way, because if not, I was going to just fucking explode. I fucking love it. And man. Uh, it was great to see. Yeah, you. no, I, I love it. And, that, and you nailed it, right? Like that's, you know, like that quote I said at the event was another thing that same shaman said to me. Uh, two years later when he was reflecting something and I was like, I know. And he looked me dead in the eye and he's like, yeah, uh-huh. A master says, thanks for the reminder. And a student says, I already know. And I was like, God, why can you crush me with a fortune cookie every single time? But I, I, John, I appreciate that, that, that sentiment for everybody listening. I, I think that the faster you learn that lesson that the moment you forget everything you know, you really find everything you do know. And you have to be willing to look at it. And and I'll say a distinction. If you think you already know the answer, there's probably a good chance you're just stuck inside your pill bottle. And so allow that to be your trigger. So if you feel so confident and so clear in such a reactive way, allow that to be your trigger to pause for a minute, get out of the pill bottle and ask maybe, is there another way? Is there a better question to ask? Like just to start practicing these things to really put them in. Cause what John said is, is absolutely huge. Cause what I'll tell you is that how I did marketing yesterday does not work today. And how I led my team yesterday does not work today. And I am not the same guy that I am yesterday. I don't have the same feelings that I have yesterday. And so being willing to trust that you have the tools in your toolbox, but the way in which you use them today might be different is really one of the best places to be. And so I echo completely what John said. Uh, there's an old quote, and um, I cannot remember where I get it from, but a, uh, a man doesn't walk in the same river twice. Yeah. Right. Because uh, when, you know, uh, it's different water and it's a different man. Yep. So you never walk in the same river twice. And I think that sediment 
is lost on a lot of people. And, you know, um, hopefully uh, every time we interact, or every time you're around me, like there's something new, or there's some growth. And like, if I become fixed or rigid or this, I hope that there's people that come and fucking shatter me into a million pieces and pull me out of it. Um, but I think if you expect that people to do that to you, you have to be willing to do that for them. Do. But there's the other issue. Not everybody's ready for it. I, I run into this more than you can. And um, it's something I ask people. I'm like, are you like, and I, I do you, the people that showed up to your event were ready to take the journey. Yes. So like they're already kind of pre-qualified. Yes. And I, and, and I, I wonder how many people show up to your event uh, because they think it's bullshit or they're going to somehow like, uh, like, you know, they, they, they have this, like, you know, I know everything. I'm the master. He's full of shit. I'm going to show him up. I'm going to come to this event to show exactly how I good I am. And I'm going to get into some dick measuring contest to prove his shit is bullshit. And I like, I, cause we used to get that back we, in the we day. Get when I we get him. Him. Yeah. And I love it. I do too. It's what, it's what I fucking live for. As soon as I hear it, I'm like, they're the, <laughs> dude, they're the protagonist in my movie. Yes. Like they self identify yes. and I'm like, let's yes. dance. I am so ready. Oh yeah. I uh, dude, I, I've had people like in the middle of like, and you, you saw this too, you, you're, you're in your mid, like, you know, I'm, I'm giving this talk. This is this piece. And all of a sudden the hand shoots up. I used to just kind of go like this, put my hand up and be like, I'll get you at the end. Then all of a sudden I got to the point as soon as the hand shut up, I said, what? And I would fucking eviscerate them. And then I would go right back to what I was doing because I knew my material so well. And uh, I got to the point where I would like just try to like curb stomp people. And then I realized that like, you know, uh, I was too aggressive. And then I, what I needed to do was I could convert them. I could use this as a learning moment. And I had to like not be so much hammer. And I had to go to that velvet yep. hammer and learn that piece. And uh, I, I just as I was sitting there, it was um, it was really interesting because I was looking at everybody's face too, being like, I wonder who's the person who doesn't buy in. Yep. And I was like going in and I was looking at every person and this, and like, it was that corner. There were those two ladies and, and I knew that like the energy was funky because you kept going back over there. And like, I'm just reading the room. Like, uh, there was that, that lawyer dude who's kind Josh. of a little heavy set. Yep. That's a life coach. Like that guy, if you would have called if like, if you would have said, Hey Josh, um, there's a hundred people out there, zombies that I'm going to need you to cut the heads off to protect George. He's like, give me the hand. <laughs> like, like that guy would go boots to skulls for Josh. you. And there were people, there were people in there that were boots to skulls, but I just kept going and being like, I wonder who the protagonist is in this movie. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and, and like, I, I got this, but then like you disarmed them so quickly that all of a sudden they became allies and like how you went into it. You're like, are you not understanding this? Like, like what are you doing? Like, you know, what's this? And the lady just happened to be extremely thoughtful. Yeah. She's like, I'm just thinking. And I was like, huh, that's an interesting one. Like it, it was, um, it was fun. I, I, I really, wish that I, I knew what I was walking into. Like, it, it was great to see with fresh eyes, but I like now in hindsight, I want to go to another one. That's why when you asked me to come speak, I was like, 100%, yeah. I would love to go back to this because now I like, you know, the, the second time, and there were people there that are like, this is my ninth one. Yeah. And they were still absolutely <laughs> fucking mind blowing. I was like, you've been to this nine times and you're this emo. I was like, God damn it. Yeah. Like I, I like, like that's a marker of extreme dedication and like your ability to be malleable and education and, and take people on this journey that you can have somebody come to nine of these and they can still be influenced by the information. That's uh that's something to be proud of. Yeah, man. Cause uh, that woman never walks in the same river twice. Yeah. And that's how, that's how, that's but, how I see it, man. Like I look at the event, like it's, it, I look at it like it's an NFL game. And if I play that same team, that same season with both teams, the same, it's still a completely different game and a completely different experience, irregardless yeah, of the which, scoreboard, which is, which is great. I mean, the, um, you know, uh, like CrossFit, for example, when they did their level ones, yep. it became so carbon copy that it came down to the wording and it was Greg's words and it was just being parroted by other people. And it was weird for me because I went and I was like, I've heard Greg give this speech. And now all of a sudden somebody like, and so they, they, they quantified it and there was no wiggle. It had to be fucking just bleh, zero Xerox. And some of the, the original magic of it, like where people were influenced to me, just fucking died that the, when it became so rigid and so fixed that there was no ability to add any personal yeah. like peace into it. And I think that there's a really interesting, like 
if you were trying to like, hey, I'm going to try to do 50 of these things, I'd be like, there's no fucking no way. way. Is there, do, do you know how few of people you can teach to do this? Fucking zero. Yeah. Like the only person, like I, I, I told, um, uh, I told somebody this. I'm like, the only person I've seen have that level of like buy-in and like conversion was Tony Robbins. Mm-hmm. Is the only one I and I met Tony years ago at a watch shop in La Jolla, and in five minutes he sold me a five thousand dollar watch and tried to give me his pit bull. <laughs> it was the weirdest thing. Like uh, he, I went in, I went into this high end watch shop. We we were playing. Uh, we we lost in the SC championship game, so we went to the Super Bowl. And um, because we had already bought take like uh, we we'd rented hotel rooms, we ended up not winning. We still had the home hotel rooms. So it said fuck it. We went. I got up early. Walked. We were in La Jolla. Walked across to the CJ Charles watch shop. Um, Tony Robbins is in there getting his watch fixed. I buy the same watch. He sells me the same watch. He's wearing like a $5,000 Panerai. Next thing you know, we're like talking about something. Somebody gave him a dog. He can't watch it. He's trying to give me his dog. And I'm like, I have a new watch and a dog. Like it was, and then he left. (laughs) And it was like, our interaction was maybe 12 minutes. And I felt like as the guy was talking to me, we had known each other for our entire lives. Like his ability to like, engage in this it's really like I, I told people i'm like the only person i've ever seen like do that is tony robbins and george i think did it almost better thanks man i appreciate it man i love you to pieces yeah it's thank you <laughs> i like too. when you say it though i have like flashbacks of moments and i was like oh my god i'm like totally making fun of myself right now because it's it's always in the moment and benevolent like i don't ever have an agenda i just meet the moment and i'm like oh this feels right to do or say and then i do it and then sometimes yeah. I get judged and I'm like, but as long as I'm honest, I can't get canceled because I'm kind of canceling myself. Yeah. Well, um, but uh, so um, years ago when we were teaching the seminars uh, at nauseum, because we taught so many of them, um, uh, like I had a lady, you know, like I uh, like there's always been an interesting thing with like profanity, for example. Yep. Um, I, I think that there's like it's kind of like uh, salt. Like not enough salt, it tastes weird. Just the right amount of salt tastes fine. And then you get to the, like, uh, all of a sudden this is way too salty. Uh, Profanity is the same way, especially in an event like that. You can use, a, and I was trying to teach my daughters this, you can use a very, very well-timed F-bomb, use some profanity to like emphasize a point, like get your fucking ass going. And it can be almost like an exclamation point. It can show emotion in this. If you just randomly be like, ah, fucking, you know, and it just sounds... Like you're an idiot. Yep. Like you just are using filler words of profanity. So like the profanity can be a very, very real tool. And, uh, you know, like how you layer that in. And like we had a, um, a lady at a seminar and one of the guys got up to give a pre, uh, to give his, you know, this, uh, like I can't remember. It was like, uh, what is athleticism? Like one of the talks. And I was like listening to him and every other word was fuck. And, th- and to the point where like, even I was like, man, he really diminished his message. Mm-hmm. He totally just has lost his entire room. He didn't know his audience. Uh, we were actually at Rich, Rich Froning's gym, which is oh, like God's Jesus. blood symbol. <laughs> yeah, yeah, like we, yeah, CrossFit, like you know, Christ. Um, and uh, uh, he's just literally dropping these f bombs, and to the point where, uh, and I, after I was like, dude, what was up with the profanity? And, and instead of being like, oh, did I curse a lot? He's like, we use a lot of profanity, and I was like, I do. He's like, yeah, I've heard you use it. I'm like, yeah, I use it tastefully Mm -hmm. and I'll use it to emphasize a point. But if I use profanity in everyday deal, then you know what? Tell me and I'll make a change. And it's super defensive. And uh, like that uh, ability to use it. Like, so, you know, like at these events, I listen and like, you know, you use a little bit of profanity, but you do it very tastefully. Uh, But, and it's, it's just like how, like, like there's these little techniques and then the hilarious part was I, I said that, and then we got an email uh, from CrossFit HQ that the lady demanded her money back because she was so offended at the profanity. And I, I gladly gave her her money back. And I was like, you know what? I am in now. If I had sat there and not noticed it, I would have been like, fuck you, I ain't giving your money back. But uh, I was like, you know what? I was bothered by his profanity yeah. too, and I gave her her money back. Yeah. Right. And so I like, and like she sent me this. Um, Eh, like a a note after like, Hey, thanks for returning my money. Uh, It was extremely hard to go on because I am a Christian and like, I take offense to that level of profanity. And I was like, well, um, 
you know, like I'm more spiritual than religious at this point. I feel like a lot of this stuff is like people arguing who has a better imaginary friend. And as long as your imaginary friend is the best one. But uh, I do feel that um, what he was doing was not disingenuous. He wasn't trying to offend. But like, you know what? I, I also realized that, you know, it was offensive to me a little bit. So I'm happy to give your money back and best of luck. Yeah. And I'm sure that woman became a customer because I wasn't willing to die on the sword of that. No. And I think like that humility piece. But no, man, you did. It was good, dude. I, I am more than, and then you asked me to come speak. And I'm like, man, I'm, I'm super honored. I, I, this is a great group of people to be included in. And I, I just want to be included in great circles. Yeah, man. Well, it, it, it's the same, man. I feel honored to have an invitation at the seat at your table. And so I accepted it willingly. I will never question it. But yeah, always, man. No, you name it, I will be in the fucking hole with you. And I will go until my last drop and my last breath because that's how I roll. I love it. So, I love it, dude. I love it. Me too. I know, man. I know. That's why we're boys. So I love it, man. So I want to put a bow on this one or else I'd talk to you all day and then not go play with my kiddo. And so um, thank you, man. Uh, this will be the first of many. We'll do the next one in person. I'll come visit in Austin. Okay. Um, but awesome. uh, what can you, um, what's the name of the podcast again? Oh, okay. Yeah. Sorry. I totally, yeah. You asked me to. It's fine. You to, did, you did this, Instagram like, earlier, but just the name of the podcast. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Just Twitter and Instagram at John Wellborn. And then uh, you can find me at Power Athlete HQ is our URL. Um, Power Athlete Inc. Because uh, Power Athlete HQ get deleted off of Instagram. <laughs> uh, but um, what was the other one? You oh, just asking? the name of the podcast. It's Power Athlete, right? Oh, yeah. It, yeah. Power Athlete Radio. Yeah. So. Um, we have, I shit you not when I say this, uh, we've been, I, I've done over 700 podcasts for Power Athlete Radio. Uh, the majority of them are guest-based, yeah. not just like me sitting there talking. So we've done, I mean, and we've interviewed some of the most amazing people. Like we've had Colin O'Grady on, we had Angela Duckworth who wrote great. Yeah. I mean, we've had, you know, some really, really killer people on, um, and to the point where I have a friend who's really, really smart PhD. And he called me one day and he's like, dude, I was going through the roster of your podcast. You realize you have like 27 PhDs worth of work, like your podcast. He's like, I would have given you like a dozen PhDs. It's, it's it's like, it's a masterclass of information. Um, so if there's a question, uh, you know, we've been doing it for over 10 years and I think it's been really excellent for me. Um, just because it allows me to connect with mm -hmm. really amazing people and have intelligent conversations. So no longer am I just reading books, having intelligent conversations with the, the greatest thinkers. I get that podcast with some of the greatest thinkers on the planet. I uh, dude, it's, 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 I feel like it's how I learn so fast. And for everybody, I, I listen. And, and if you haven't figured this out by listening to this podcast, I did a whole lot of fucking listening. Cause when John speaks, I listen. And so <laughs> I highly, I highly recommend <laughs> you go check out, do you laugh? My whole audience is going to be like, George has never spoken that little in his entire fucking existence as a human <laughs> being. Uh, I kid you not. I'll send you all the DM screenshots and they all make fun of me. Um, well, it, um, the problem is, is that uh, I, I don't know if it's your brain works ADD like mine. Or, so I get it. Yeah. Like I understood yes. everything yeah. you said. I knew every path, every open loop. I'm like, I know where we're going. And then like, yeah. w like without fail, like you brought it right back. And I'm like, oh yeah, no, like John and I think the same too. Like, this is awesome. Just got to tie little bows. You on. do. You just yeah, got to put no, wrapping I, paper on yeah. the end of it and then it's ethos. Yeah. And then you're like, perfect. Yeah. I've embodied it. So, well, man, it's been an honor yeah. um, for everybody listening. Please make sure you check out John shit. Uh, John Wellborn on Instagram, Twitter. Um, he loves challenging thoughts. You know, he gets bored and plays on the internet when he has time. But the only thing I wanted to say, John, that I didn't clear up earlier is I don't think you should be on social media more than you are. I think you should be doing exactly what you're doing. And whenever the time is yeah. right, you're there because uh, I'm not on social media that often and it still works. So we are good yeah. there. So for everybody listening, make sure you check out John, go to the podcast. We will have him back on episode two, three, four, five, six. John, thanks for being here, man. It means the world to me. Thank you, George. I really appreciate you having me on and giving me a platform to speak. And uh, more importantly, I appreciate uh, the event you put on and really the the, the, the friendship. And uh, I'm just humbled. Yeah, so man, thank I'm, you so much and uh, look forward to seeing you again. It's a gift. And for those wondering, uh, for the October-November event in Montana, we're locking in dates. Uh, once I have dates, I can give you the exact date. But John is going to be speaking and dropping his knowledge and we didn't even get into the multiple seven figure business and all that, but you can understand why that's all easy for him when you listen to him speak. So you'll be able to experience that, meet him, come hang out. So uh, if you want that, shoot us a DM on Instagram that says event or go to mindandgeorge.com slash event and we will make the rest easy for you. So without that, 
uh, I'm going to shut up and stop talking. So remember, relationships will always beat algorithms. I'll either see you in the next episode or you'll hear me in your earballs. But either way, here's the outro.